Okay, we're ready to go. Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, certainly to the General Finance Committee and to the public uh, viewing today, December the 15th, our 9 a.m. General Finance meeting. I would like to call this meeting to order at exactly 9 a.m. Um, I would confirm uh, we are missing uh, Councillor Hayes, Councillor Donalda Hayes, or Committee Member Hayes today. Other than that, we have a full uh, roster here today and we have uh, confirmed quorum here and now. Uh, I will uh, confirm as well that the CAO clerk and members of our senior management team and staff are present. Uh, public input on the agenda was invited at the following email, which is TML public comment at muskokalakes.ca. Uh, no uh, correspondence was received. Um, a public notice here that today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka website and YouTube channel by participating in the open public meeting today. You are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. I would like to acknowledge we do have a supplementary agenda today, and we'll be working through that uh, through the course of the uh, of the meeting. Um, I would uh, also acknowledge uh, where am I here with my comments? Yeah, sorry, uh, supplementary agenda. So we do have uh, comments received uh, from the Muskoka Lakes Association item uh, 6E 2022 budget. We have uh, uh, Murray Dixon has a presentation on the uh, issues facing Skeleton Lake water access property owners. Uh, I would ask at this point in time if there are any uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest. Committee? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, we have just a note here, the motions are, have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite this meeting. Uh, members shall physically raise their hand until the chair has confirmed a vote. If the vote is unclear, a verbal vote shall be recorded by the clerk. Uh, this is not considered a recorded vote. Thank you for that. I would then uh, invite our item 4A, our first delegation, uh, Don Hack of uh, Sierra Consultants uh, regarding the Recreation Parks, Trails and Facilities Master Plan update. I would also welcome both Asia and John, uh, his uh, people working with him and with us, uh, welcome them to this meeting as, as well. I would uh, hand the floor over to uh, Chair Mazan as it relates to that committee for a few comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Zavitz. Um, and as you'll note, today's presentation is, is an interim report. It's the first step really into delving into the background information and soliciting public input. Um, to help shape our vision for recreation in the future. With that note, um, I would like to thank our consultants who you will be hearing from shortly, as well as staff who have been working uh, quite a bit in the background to pull this information together for us today. And in particular, I'd like to th uh, thank again, our steering committee who has also been highly engaged in this process. As a reminder, we have people um, from council on that committee, but we also have a, a lot of members from the public who have been actively and uh, fully engaged in this process. So I would like to take a moment to thank them for their ongoing efforts. With that, I would like to hand the floor over to John from Sierra Planning, who will be taking us through the background information and, and certainly staff led through Director Becking is available for any kind of questions or comments the committee may have. Thanks. Good, thank you. Okay, John, welcome, sir. You've got the floor. Um, you have uh, five minutes, but certainly we're very all very interested in your interim report. So please proceed. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of committee uh, and staff. Uh, and just echo uh, uh, Susan's point about uh, thanking the committee for the work they've done to date. Um, we have a lot of slides. We, we do have, uh, even with an extension, a little bit of a, um, a challenge. So we're going to go through it a fair clip. So um, Whoever is uh, changing the slides, um, I'll be asking to, to that to be done quite quickly. So if you can go forward a couple of slides, that would be good. 
That's it. Good. So work completed to date. A lot of work has been done um, and is um, analyzed in a series of, of background reports. Uh, and so what you see here today is really sort of the essence of that uh, prior to us getting into the actual building of the, the directions and the recommendations for the plan. Next slide. So we're going to break it down by the particular assets here. So just going through um, in terms of the arenas, um, you know, the asset replacement value at around just under $18 million. That's essentially the price of one new single pad rink. If you look at it in those terms, you have two rinks. Uh, that value is essentially for one. There are significant capital inputs that uh, the council is aware of. And Bala Arena, as you'll see, is somewhat uh, underutilized. Next slide. And here it is in, uh, in, uh, to give those data. So we focus really only on prime time ice evenings and, and weekends. And uh, as you can see, there is, a dis there is a distinction between the two arenas, Port Carling operating pretty much as you would expect it for an arena that is um, very well used and sort of near capacity, um, but uh, you know, somewhat the reverse for, uh, for Bala uh, as well. Next slide. In terms of um, operating expenditures, revenues, pre-pandemic, uh, the, the outline of, uh, of that work really suggests that the, the, the tax support, the subsidy is pretty high. Getting into the 60s and 70% overall, um, it should really be in the, in the sort of 40% range, even 50% range. It varies, so don't treat that as a specific, but uh, it is important to recognize that. Community centers, the upshot is the value of these, thank you. The upshot is the value of these 13 community centers by way of history. And you can see the distribution there is quite, quite, uh, quite interesting and very effective. Um, in terms of the asset value, sizable amount. The real challenge going forward, as with many buildings across the province, is the need to create compliance with the AODA requirements um, and to improve accessibility. So that will be part of the plan. Next slide. Thank you. So um, the uh, utilization for the community centers is actually, um, it's uh, just to reverse those numbers, it's about sort of ranges between 20 and 24%. That's not too bad for, uh, for community centers. They're far uh, less used, as you may uh, appreciate, compared to active sports centers, for example. But, uh, you know, in the sort of 20% range is, uh, is, is certainly an acceptable level of usage. Can you do better? Well, you have lots of time to be able to do that. And on the right side of the page there, level of service. What we've tried to do is start the conversation about which uh, communities these community centers serve, because it's not clear that they all serve just local neighborhoods or, or surrounding areas, but some obviously have a broader township-wide function as well. And that's going to be relevant to our thinking in terms of um, choices for investment and operations going forward. Next slide. Subsidy, again, this is typical. You don't expect community centers of this nature where they are primarily historic structures used for a range of community groups, usually a, a whole you know, a gathering space, maybe a kitchen, this sort of thing, and with that utilization. So the amount of subsidy, as we show there as a percent of cost, is, is pretty much as expected. Uh, obviously, things can be uh, improved, but that, that requires demand to make that happen. Next uh, slide. The only other comment I would suggest there is that you saw on the previous slide, we don't need to go back, but the amount of capital that's estimated to be required over the next five years is, is not that high compared to the overall value of those buildings. So they're in good shape. The issue is that estimate of capital needs does not include improvements in accessibility, which is going to add capital dollars onto every one of those buildings in order to bring it up to, uh, to those standards uh, over a period of time. In terms of next support, we don't need to focus on this one. This, this just drills down to the individual subsidy by building. So it's really just for purposes of detail. We can come back to it if you need to ask a question on it. Next one. Parks and trails. Um, uh, the overall, we did a, a detailed inventory and my colleague, John Joyce from uh, MBTW will run through a couple of slides uh, shortly. But here you've got a good spread of, of parks. 
um, good amount of uh, trails, fair condition. Are there things to improve? Uh, yes, there are. And the, the public survey was very helpful in identifying people's levels of satisfaction. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, this one we can we can gloss over. Moderate capital expectations without us getting into the REC master plan. So the REC master plan will add capital dollars on top of what you see at the bottom of the page. Parks are expenditure items rather than revenue items, unless we're talking about major, if you were to count major events and other things that happen in parks. So um, subsidy is not really the relevant com conversation as it relates to parks. Next slide. Similarly with trails. Next slide, if you can. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, similarly with trails, um, very modest uh, uh, capital needs. But again, the master plan will layer on the, uh, the expectations for going further uh, in improving the trails and the spread of the trails. So on to the next slides. And if John Joyce is on the line, uh, John, I, th um, I think you'd want to take the next uh, three slides, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, sure, no problem, John, thank you. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so our focus on the work to date has been specific to all the exterior spaces within the uh, township. So we've been looking at the areas, uh, exterior spaces associated with the marinas and community centers. We've been looking at all of your parks assets and we've been looking at all of your trails. Um, that approach or that overview has been pretty holistic. Uh, it's included background document review, review of aerial photos, uh, looking into your, your geo hub for the municipality of Muskoka, um, internet searches, and we've had feet on the ground. So we've done ground truthing on, on all of these facilities. And really the whole purpose of this was for us at this initial stage to determine exactly what you have uh, within the township, uh, get a general idea of what condition the existing exterior facilities are in, and then creating an inventory that the good folks at Sierra Planning can use as part of their level of service calculations uh, associated with the township. Uh, this slide, and there's certainly more detail associated with all of these inventories for parks and trails um, within the uh, larger draft document. Um, so we have looked at all of the arenas and community centers, simply a list here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, similarly, we've been to all of the communities, looked at all the municipal parks, uh, looked at how those parks are used, who they're used by, what type of classification we would assign to those parks. Next slide, please. And one of our more interesting tasks was looking at all of the trails uh, that you have out there. Um, at, in addition to that, one of the, the biggest things that we're looking at with respect to trails was um, the existing inventory that you have uh, within the township, but also what types of trails those are uh, and assigning trail typologies that are often used within the, the landscape uh, architecture industry um, associated with you know, uh, the type with respect to how you access them, uh, who is going to use those, how they're rated, easy, easy, moderate, or difficult, uh, level of service, and potential facilities that would be associated with them. Next slide. Thanks, John. So back back to me. Um, and just to um, indicate, in addition to the outdoor spaces, we also reviewed the indoor buildings. We have one of our colleagues on the uh, team is um, WGD Architects, and they went through all of the buildings plus the two arenas. And there is a separate report that looks at their um, views on the condition and what needs to happen within the buildings by way of uh, compliance for AODA and other matters. On this slide, level of service is really um, it's a methodology that we use to understand what you have. So what assets, what services you provide and where you want to go based on understanding what level of service the municipality uh, currently provides uh, and knowing how the population and the needs of the communities are going to change. Uh, it gives an opportunity to determine where you, where you want to go in terms of planning. So it's fairly fundamental. It's not one thing. It's not one standard. It's, a, it's an approach, as you see on the, um, uh, on the page there, of uh, addressing um, sufficiency of, uh, of current services and reflecting people's needs going forward. Next slide. So, you know, there are different ways to look at it. And one is in terms of the financials. And we need to be very careful here to indicate that 
you can get into somewhat dangerous territory if you if you assume that every municipality of the 400 and however many there are in the province are going to operate on the same basis and give the same level of service. There are geographic realities. There's a reality of how much service you provide. There's rural versus urban, big city, small. So the numbers vary. But what is a good way place to start is to recognize that the township of Muskoka Lakes operates firstly within a regional system, meaning there are services that people use for indoor aquatics, sports fields, arenas that are outside of the township. And uh, uh, as a result of that, um, that affects the amount that you currently pay in terms of provision of services. So looking at that number, one of the standards that is sometimes used as a guide is the spend per capita. So at that, at the, based on the permanent population or the population that's reported on the census, that's just shy of $300 per, per person. If we were to, and again, just for analytical purposes, if we were to say, well, we have a very sizable, um, you know, three season population, let's just say, that, that is here. So just if you just double that number, from 6,600 up to 13,000, uh, you know, you, you drop the amount of expenditure. So it is just a guideline, but it helps us understand the regionality of services. And that will be a key feature of the plan. Uh, Muskoka Lakes is not an island uh, unto itself. Next slide. So the, the key takeaway from there, this is really a resource slide for anyone to look at. You can see the numbers vary. The Ontario average, to the extent it is relevant at all, is around $135 per capita based on some, some historic numbers. The larger the municipality, the bigger the, the amount that's spent. And you can see Bracebridge there is a good example. These numbers are somewhat historic, but you can see there based on permanent population, you know, they're up around $300 and they have a couple of couple of biggish facilities in, in town there as well. So it is pretty much a guideline, but it uh, tells us uh, something of value. Next slide. Next slide, if you can. Yeah, thanks. So this one is certainly is not something we want to go through line by line. But you break it down by the particular activities, whether it be uh, ice surfaces or, or parkland or gymnasia, whatever it may be, there are standards that you will find across the province that may be relevant. Again, benchmarking can be a very dangerous exercise. As a practice, we are not uh, a firm that likes to uh, plan by numbers. It is, it is very much understanding the level of service based on certain measures such as this, the standards to the extent they're relevant or can be calculated for Muskoka Lakes are on the right-hand side, but we look at other measures. So give you ice pads as one example. Uh, there is a very rich standard based on the permanent population um, of one pad per 3,300 uh, residents. That's backed up by the utilization numbers that tell us that you know, there is an underutilization of the of the uh, of one of the rinks that is in town, uh, so on and so forth. But really, the breakdown here is that ice, indoor aquatics, gymnasia, and some sports fields they need to be viewed at a regional scale. Uh, other ones can be more more localized. And there John, are some if I might, if I might, sir, just if you could perhaps highlight, if you don't mind. Thank you. Just in terms of the interest of time. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Next slide, then, please. Currently, no parks and recreation department as such. A consideration for council will be uh, whether you, need, you wish to uh, provide that level of um, uh, professional resource to make this plan uh, happen in a timely fashion. Public input was generally good. 357 responses to a survey um, is, uh, is generally pretty good. Um, user group responses, excellent. 53 organizations responded. And we had a public meeting, and of course, um, uh, the majority of council have been uh, uh, in discussions with us on uh, on this plan earlier in the year as well. Next slide. We'll just brush over this, please. And the next one, we'll come back. Yes, yeah, let's just focus on next steps. So you can see a lot of information, a lot of work done, very detailed, um, but rising from it are some key findings. Our next goal is to develop some options and directions uh, in, uh, in the new year, coming back to this committee after we've gone through the uh, REC committee and then uh, uh, on to some further public consultation, then drafting the plan, 
um, and uh, from that finally getting through adoption. It is a bit of a long uh, process to do that if you follow the community um, uh, engagement process, but you know, by sometime in Q2, I think the plan, if it is uh, is adopted, will be uh, will be ready at that point. And that's it, Mr. Chair. I can hand back to you for questions. Sure, thank you very much, and uh, great presentation, great initiative. Of course, uh, as you're in the discovery phase of uh, what looks to be a great 2022 for this township. Uh, thank you to you, to your committee, uh, and, and to all. I would give uh, either Director Becking or uh, Councillor Mazan any sort of a last word to put a bow tie on that for right now, and then I'll call on Councillor uh, Roberts. Any, no, good, okay. Okay, good, Councillor Roberts, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and through you. And, and I do not echo your, your uh, raving review of this presentation. I found it to be very disappointing. Um, I went back and I looked up the RFP, um, what, what we were supposed to cover in the RFP, and it was to create a vision and guide principles for cre recreation, identify trends which will be influenced for the delivery and accessibility relevant and, and sustainable services, infuse the principles of sustainability, accessibility, et cetera. Um, what I see what was presented here is a narrow view of a budget information that will come will be more relevant for next year's council because this year's council is already already uh, uh, will decide today on the budget or short right shortly and there's no money as you know a recreation master plan is 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 a great document to give us vision for the future but it is at the appetite of council whether we implement anything in the recreation plan so. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, I, I'm gonna close off on that. I'm not happy with this presentation. It's too focused on closing down buildings. When I read between the lines, I'm looking for a recreation master plan. And I ask that this um, plan or the final draft or the pre-final pre draft, go to the Parks and Recreation um, Committee for review prior to um, going to general and finance because it's got to be like written that uh, in, in simple terms and everything that was presented today would go in an appendix. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I wonder um, if uh, Chair Mazan could speak just to the uh, point of um, is, is committee in support of this report or this isn't just a con our consultants uh, saying what they think. This to me is a, a compendium of a lot of uh, work and a in a, in a sort of a resource discovery mode, as I said earlier. So, Councilman. Yeah, Th yeah thank you, Chair uh, Zavitt. Suzanne, tonight. do you want to comment on this? Sorry, can you hear me? Or am I frozen? Okay. No. Okay, you can hear me? Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair uh, Zavitz, and I would concur with your comments. Um, as noted at the beginning, this is an interim report, and uh, we strongly felt that this committee deserves to have um, a summary of the information that has been collected thus far uh, by our consultants. So this is a summary. We all have a binder that is filled with the details to back it. Uh, the, it's the foundational information. The second part, unfortunately, that was somewhat glossed over in the presentation, just given our time constraints, was uh, touching upon the public input. I think our steering committee has really worked hard um, as a committee and ensuring that the public has many opportunities to be inputting into the vision of what recreation should be looking like in the future. So um, just like our planning processes with, with uh, uh, our official plan and others, you know, this is the background information. This is to get the process started, but by as noted in the next steps, you know, there's gonna be many touch points from this point moving forward. So. Hopefully that clarifies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Committee member Nishikawa, I'm going to let you go first, Ruth, and then uh, the mayor, and then uh, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. I just wanted to um, mention uh, some comments from um, Donelda uh, Hayes from Walker's Point, and, and it much re reflects the, the comments that I had brought forward at our committee level that the information that uh, has been shared does not represent what has been going on at our community centers. 
And so we should look at that much closer. Um, you know, the fact that we're not including the hours that the library um, at the Walker's Point Community Center, because other, ish, other things happen at the community center in tandem with the library as well. And, and some of that information was not. So it was a much along the same line that, that Council Roberts brought forward is the disappointment that the information, um, it, it just feels like this does not represent our township at all. Thank you. Wow. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, um, I guess I have a different take on it. Um, Walker's Point in particular is unique because it does have the library attached to it. Um, but looking at a high level, and I think that's what um, Councilor Mazan was trying to do with just bringing us up to speed and all of council up to speed uh, as to where we're at in this process. Um, we probably won't get through this in the next two months. It may not be through. I can say we, probably, we won't be through this. Um, but you know, as we set the long-term future of the Township of Muskoka Lakes, it takes time and it takes time to get the job done right. Um, my one question, uh, I guess, to uh, Mr. Hack is that um, the AODA requirements, um, and I apologize, I might've missed it. When are we required to update that? And then I'll have a comment afterwards. Yeah, the uh, AODA requirements through you, uh, Mr. Chair, thanks for the question. The AODA requirements set that target around 2025, but the way it rolls out is if and when you go into a building to undertake renovations or maintenance of any significant degree, that is then when the requirement kicks in for you to take care of certain accessibility issues. So it's not, it's not clear cut in terms of uh, a deadline that you must uh, <clears throat> meet, but you, you certainly need to recognize that in maintaining these buildings going forward, when you do so, you're going to have to bring in accessibility um, uh, factors into play. So it, it is a, an item of, of significance here. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. It's, uh, and clearly, obviously that wouldn't be contemplated in our 10 year capital forecast right now. Um, and if I do remember, as we've updated and made accessible washrooms, uh, they're not cheap, so to speak, um, or adding ramps to some of our buildings to be able to make them more accessible. I, I, the one thing I really did find interesting out of this, and just as a comment, and I appreciate the interim step, um, <clears throat> you know, when we talk about cost recovery, the second highest cost recovery by um, items was our swim program we recover 46%, uh, arenas are at 20% and our community centers right now are at five. And now we may not have been capturing all the data and I fully appreciate that, but it's interesting because two months ago, the swim program was on the chopping block because it was just a waste of money. So um, all of that I think helps us form and make better educated decisions. And I, I appreciate Councilor Shikawa and I agree that we haven't fully reflected Walker's point in particular in adding it. And um, as this starts to flesh out, we'll make sure, and maybe our, our community centers end up at 8%. We know that it's a level of service that uh, we are committed to, just as we did with keeping the Bal Arena open. So um, I look forward to this discussion. It's not gonna be an easy one going forward, but uh, we, we need to appreciate <clears throat> the assets, the trails, the parks and everything we have in our inventory and make sure that we are doing the right job for all our constituents. So thank you. Good, thank you. Just before I call on uh, Councillor Kelly, I just would uh, cautionary note here too, that in fact, uh, this is a two-way street. So the reason this report has come forward is for us to look at it, to listen to it, to understand it and to provide comments. So, you know, your comments are very well taken and um, please let them continue. So I know they'll get baked into that further version, that further thinking uh, as this unfolds. So thank, again, thank you for that uh, I don't think it's viewed as criticism at all. It's constructive and uh, we would uh, move forward with that. So Councillor Kelly, you go ahead. Uh, thank you and through you, uh, uh, Chair. I, I, I was going to just offer a contrary opinion to uh, uh, Member Robert's contrary opinion. I actually thought it was a very helpful report. Uh, I tend to live in a very uh, closed little bubble and I can tell you a lot about Port Carling and very little about anything beyond. And uh, that's that's, for me, uh, it's a great step for me to understand how how what happens right under my nose 
fits in with the rest of the township. So I think that's terrific. Uh, number two, I think it's uh, particularly valuable uh, in light of some of the discussions we're having around budget and, and planning going forward. I think that's uh, uh, the timing is good. I don't think we have a copy, but that will be distributed at some point, I hope, I suspect. And then the last comment that I have, and it's a question, not a comment. Uh, when it comes to Port Carling and when it comes to the arena and the community center, since there's sort of a, a fuzzy line, I think, between the township office, which clearly is not Parks and Rec, at least I hope it's not Parks and Rec, and the, uh, and the community center. And as we start planning perhaps to uh, hold our council meetings in the community center, would it not be useful just to throw that on? It's part of the same campus. Uh, I, and it may have been there, it may have gone past me so fast that it, but it seems to me that adding that to the inventory with a heavy asterisk that it's not currently really anything to do with parts at Parks and Rec, but to the extent we need to do something different, I think it will factor uh, heavily in the planning and in the vision going forward. And I think it would be useful just to have that information, the same level that you're disclosing on the rest of the assets uh, included in the same table. Thank you. Good. Thank you, and I see uh, Director Becking had his hand up, and then Barbara I'll call on you, you Barbara Bridgman. Thank you. Ken, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to Councillor uh, Kelly's comments, um, I think he raises a good point that um, when considering Port Carling, you have to consider uh, this is a campus, as opposed to a series of individual buildings. Um, and they are not, um, they, they are all interrelated. They are all interconnected <clears throat> on a variety of fronts. Um, I, would, I, would, uh, I would suggest that we would be clouding the issue by including it in this discussion, but I would suggest that it would be very relevant to consider it when we consider the future of the township hall. And that's probably the better lens at which to bring it into the, into the discussion and the debate. Um, certainly if, if it's the will of committee that, that it should be included, obviously it will, but I, I wouldn't want to um, perhaps cloud the issue uh, inappropriately at this point. That would be my recommendation to you. Thank you. And Councillor Kelly is speaking. You said yes. So we seem to have agreement on that. Thank you for that. I would just uh, note pre uh, uh, Councillor Bridgman that uh, the presentation, Councillor Kelly, is actually included in the supplementary agenda uh, posted uh, yesterday afternoon. So just for that uh, and for the public, please go right there and you can see the presentation that's in front of us now as a committee. OK, uh, Councillor Bridgman, you go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Zavitz. And just a quick comment as the other member of council on this committee, um, these, these numbers to, to um, Councillor Roberts' uh, comments about vision, et cetera, these are the background numbers. And these are really important as a member of the committee to look at those going forward. And, and some basic guidance from this council on certain huge expenditures like arenas are going to shape what we what we do going forward and our vision going forward. So I always think all information is helpful, but I also think it was really important to have everybody on, on this committee understand our usage and the dollar amounts of it and, and foundational. And I'm looking forward to um, moving forward with a little direction from, from council to that vision. So I just wanted to reinforce that, um, Chair Zavitz. Good, thank you very much, and, and you have. Um, given that, now, uh, Councillor Edwards, you go right ahead. Now I'll wrap this up. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, five minutes is not enough. And when we have uh, consultants and that, they shouldn't be just given five minutes. That's, that's for delegations and that. that it's, and that also the, the information should be sent out at least a week before. I've had over 1,400 pages to go through, and I, I, I was reading for, for tomorrow's meeting because I can't read today because I'm in meetings. And that, uh, you know, uh, and that we're talking millions of dollars here. What does make uh, sense is if we put a new ice pad in, we're looking at close to $18 million. 
And then if we, um, we uh, borrow money for that, it's going to be about 22, 23 million by the time it's paid off. So maybe a, a million dollars for an ice pad. And that isn't a bad idea. And that, uh, and that keeping them going. So uh, I, I won't make any more uh, comments uh, and that on it. And I was hoping for a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, see no other hands. Uh, I guess the words ring in my ears, uh, continuous improvement as we all strive to get better at what we all do together collectively. Uh, certainly information quicker, faster, better, more uh, is, is certainly the order of the day and we'll uh, endeavor, I'm, you know, staff, uh, is doing what they can do, and uh, but but point well taken. So thank you very much for that. Okay, uh, given that, I'm going to thank uh, our consultants, Sierra, uh, John Hack, uh, Asia, and and John for for being here today, being with us. Thank you, and I appreciate your your words. Uh, it's going to be a long road and uh, an exciting one. So thank you, and we'll uh, be seeing much of you again, I'm sure. Um, with that, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you. Uh, the next item, item 4B, is um, uh, Kevin Farley uh, is going to discuss and present to us uh, a concept called disc golf. And so, uh, Kevin, are you, you here, sir? There he is. Welcome. Good morning. We, we can't hear you. There we go. Can you hear me now? Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Here, I'm just going to uh, share my screen. I have a presentation. Oh, I need permission to share my screen. You can't. Could you email that presentation to us like right now? I guess we can't share that screen for. Oh. Technical uh, reason. Shoot, uh, I can try and do that quickly. How about how about we go on to item four C and we'll come right back to you, Kevin, in 15, okay. 20 minutes. Does that okay. work for you? Okay, 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 excellent. Thank you, sir. And we'll be we'll be right back because you do have my interest. Okay, I'm gonna uh, if if Amy McDonald can be here, I'm not sure if she's ready. Is she? Okay, very good. So I'm going to call on um, Amy McDonald. Welcome, uh, Amy. Uh, the Port Carling Figure Skating Club um, regarding the uh, Orser Foundation Summer Skating School um, request. There you are. Welcome. Good morning. She's just connecting now. Amy, you're you muted. There we go. Okay. There you go. Hey, hi. 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 Um, go ahead. You have minutes. Should I just get into it? You should. <laughs> I'm here uh, on behalf of the Port Carling Skating Club. Uh, we have put in a request to host our annual Brian Orser event which we've done, we've missed it the last three years due to Brian's engagement and then COVID, obviously. Um, previous to that, we hosted it for six years. It draws skaters from not only, like athletes from not only all around Canada, but also globally, and is a huge fundraiser for our club. Um, I am the fundraising chairperson for the Port Carling Skating Club. And we bank on 50% of our operating budget uh, through fundraising, which is pretty significant. Obviously, that is to keep costs low and to help families that um, just to make sure everybody has the opportunity to skate and be part of the club in Port Carling. Uh, the Brian Orser event, it, um, in the past, we've made from it anywhere from $4,000 to $6,000. So it's very significant fundraiser that we've been missing over the last three years. Uh, what we need from you 
is um, authorization to put the rink in, um, the ice in, in August. So originally in the letter that we submitted, the, the date was August 22nd. That has been changed um, to August 29th. So it's bumped a week up. Now the ice we would need in for August 29th. They do, it's called Brian Orser Summer School, for those of you that aren't aware. And he trains these athletes on our ice. And then at the end of the week, hosts a performance day. So the, we, as a club, sell tickets and organize the day. And it's been very successful and popular for the township. Um, that show would be on September 3rd, so the end of their week. And then our skating season would start right after. So the ice really were requesting it go in a week earlier to host this event. Um, they would be renting the ice uh, throughout the week. We, we are only requesting one day for the community center and ice to be donated to the club. And that would be the performance day where we do our fundraiser um, for the club. And that's September 3rd. Uh, we host a meet and greet after the event in the community center for everyone that has purchased tickets to meet the athletes. Uh, and we have in the past done that in the upstairs of the community center. And that's the area that we would request for the week, the upstairs. Uh, that's used for off-ice training and where the athletes can eat and rest. Any questions? Okay, Amy, listen, thank you so much. You have uh, provided much clarity uh, to um, what I perceive to be your ask, and I'm not sure the others. So um, the fact that you're really coming forward and asking for one day, and in fact, the event will uh, self-fund it, uh, itself through rental of our facility um, is a, a, endearing for me, certainly, and, and others, as we're right here and now at budget time um, and trying to contemplate uh, this. I would look to committee here. Um, do I have any, do we have any sense of any, any comfort with this? Uh, do you feel that we do not have a motion? I do, we do not have a motion going forward. Uh, we could, I suppose, cr create one. There's a thumbs up. So I'm getting general nodding of heads here. Um, I, consensus to bring it to council. Yeah, so I, I okay. Okay. We could somehow do a vote today if we had two thirds support, which it certainly looks like we do. I'm going to first let the mayor speak, Councillor Kelly, and then uh, Councillor Edwards. Go ahead. Thank you, mayor. Mr. Chair. We've done this in the past. It's an awesome event for uh, Muskoka, for Muskoka Lakes, and uh, fully in support of it. I don't know if we need a motion or we just have direction to staff to put the ice in. I'll look to the clerk as to which way we move forward on that, but it certainly has been done in the past and 100% supportive of it again. Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly? Uh, pretty much the same echo. The only uh, obvious uh, issue that we have to understand is we don't know where we'll be from COVID uh, restrictions. I think I heard the word uh, uh, feeding the kids in the community center. We know there's restrictions on that currently. There may not be in nine months. On the other hand, there may be more restrictions. So we've got a go into it with eyes wide open, but I, I know this has been done many times. It brings a big spirit to the community and, and I'm, I'm all in favor. Okay, and good. these are all international athletes. So they will be taking serious precautions as well. As far as where we are in September or August, who knows, but um, they are very thorough with their COVID precautions. And we would create uh, that sense of term in the terms of reference anyway. So I do, you know, point well taken. C Councillor uh, Edwards. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I fully support this. I've uh, been to it. it. It's great for our uh, community. Uh, you, you, you see Olympic athletes like Patrick Chan, and seen them almost grow up with it and, and other ones. So uh, I would support this 100%. Thank you. 
Okay, good. Thank you for that. So uh, I'm going to ask you, just have a look at everyone on the screen here. I think it seems to me we have a consensus. We do need a consensus. What I would do, and I'm saying that everyone is uh, saying yes to it, is that we would, uh, the consensus would then uh, create, uh, I guess, yeah, we'll just direct staff to bring this forward to uh, council in January uh, for that fulsome uh, vote of support. Um, seeing that, and everybody's uh, giving me heads up, thumbs up. Okay, that's what we'll do. Staff has uh, duly noted. Uh, Amy, thank you very much for bringing this forward. And uh, we look forward to the event. And yes. thank you for all you Please do. Please buy tickets. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have a day. Okay, I'm going to go back to, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Kevin Farley, is Kevin available? Did we get the, for that? okay. Uh, Kevin, sir, there? Sorry about, sorry about this, uh, there you go. We're gonna put your presentation up. That looks like you even, there you go. Okay, Kevin, are you? There we go, I'm here. Okay, great, there you go. Welcome and uh, you've got the floor for five minutes, please. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Zavitz. Thank you uh, uh, to the uh, rest of the councilors here. Uh, and for the uh, time to uh, present you guys uh, some information on disc golf. So um, I personally, my name is Kevin Farley. I live in Huntsville. Uh, I have a cottage on Acton Island and all of my family live or cottage in and around Bala. I've previously served for several years as a board member of the Muskoka Lakes Chamber of Commerce and as its president for two years. I'm the owner and operator of Fluent Disc Sport, a professional disc golf course design and installation firm. And I'm here to speak to you about disc golf and its potential in Muskoka Lakes. So first off, what is disc golf? So disc golf has the same principles as traditional or what we call ball golf. Uh, we try to get the disc in the basket in as few throws as possible. There are different discs depending on the length and shape of the shot, including drivers, mid-range and putters. We have multiple tees to allow courses to be played by everyone from novice to professionals. And we play our sport year round, even in the snow. Uh, discs themselves for the public uh, average uh, price only 15 to $25, so very low barrier to entry. So who's playing disc golf? By the numbers, it's lots of people. According to UDisc, which is a disc golf app for discovering courses and recording rounds, and is estimated to record about one in every five to 10 rounds actually played worldwide, our sport has been experiencing a 50% year-on-year growth since 2015, and due to being a COVID safe sport, 200% and 400% growth respectively in the last two years. On the second graph, you can see the growth broken down by age groups from 2015 to 2021. And what's most interesting is that the fastest growing age brackets are between the ages of 40 and 70. There are dedicated junior tournaments now meeting the demands of youth players, and even the City of Toronto has added three temporary winter courses just to deal with the demand from the new playing public. Next slide, please. Disc golfers tend to be a very dedicated group who are actively searching out new courses and opportunities to play. 90% of players indicated that they're willing to drive at least two hours for a tournament. More impressive is that more than 40% of players will drive up to a full day. We had players from Michigan in the recent Thin Ice Tournament in November in Halliburton, and the upcoming Sudbury Ice Bowl in January currently has players registered from Huntsville, Barrie, Sault Ste. Marie, Burlington, and Peterborough. For casual play, at least 60% of players spend a minimum of $100 on average in the communities that they visit for disc golf. And even average two-day tournaments can have an economic impact of over $80,000 on the local economy. And those numbers come from the Midland summer solstice. Next, please. Disc golf courses do not look like golf courses. We play above the ground, not on it, meaning they maintain a much more natural appearance. Our sport thrives on a mixture of open and wooded areas with moderate elevation changes. And we try to highlight the best natural features of the properties, such as boulders, old growth trees, water features, and views. Tee pads are typically natural, gravel, artificial turf, or concrete, and have amenities like benches and bag hooks. 
Signage is used throughout the course, including a welcome sign with course map, rules, and etiquette, T signs with hole information, directional signs, and safety signs. Lastly, our targets are galvanized steel baskets that come with 25-year warranties, even when installed outdoors in public use settings, providing long-lasting returns. Disc golf is a global sport. So currently, there are over 11,500 courses in 77 countries. 8,000 of those courses are in the United States. However, Canada has only 300 courses right now, only 75 in Ontario and nine in Muskoka currently. There is a huge potential for state-of-the-art designs bringing new modern courses to Muskoka. Currently, Muskoka Lakes residents are traveling up to 45 minutes to, to the closest course in Bracebridge. Gravenhurst, Bracebridge, and Huntsville all have disc golf close to their urban centers. And South and West Muskoka have the best locations to attack day trippers out of Toronto, uh, particularly when you take into account the willingness to drive up to two hours to play. At Fluent Disc Sport, I've designed, upgraded, and consulted on more than 20 disc golf courses, and we currently are installing Muskoka's first championship level disc golf course, one of only five in the province. Over the past year, in an effort to bring modern, state-of-the-art design concepts and techniques to Canada and elevate the quality of courses being made available to players, Fluent Disc Sport has formed a partnership with the number one name in disc golf course design, Help Design of Austin, Texas. Help Design is widely accepted as the number one name in disc golf. Oh, sorry, can we go back? Uh, course design based on rankings, distinct, uh, distinctions, and awards. Hillcrest Farms, which is in Prince Edward Island, is the number one course in Canada and actually the number two course in the entire world and has hosted the Canadian Nationals three years uh, in a row. Uh, our partnership grew out of a shared vision and desire to help communities thrive through disc sport. John Houck has also solo designed more than 120 courses and an unprecedented 18 for the PDGA World and National Championships. Together, we've committed to a long-term vision for disc golf in Canada and more specifically to Muskoka with a long-term goal of making Muskoka a worldwide destination for disc golfers. In order to address the lack of courses on the west side of Muskoka, we've identified two locations in the township of Muskoka Lakes that would be ideal. Next, please. Like many, I grew up playing golf at Milford Manor and it still holds a nostalgic place in my memory. As it happens, ball golf and disc golf are actually quite compatible when designed properly. And many golf courses, including a number in Southern Ontario have added disc golf overlaid on top of their courses in a successful effort to expand their player base. Uh, landscape features on the Milford Manor property are ideal for disc golf. It's currently uh, fairly cleared because of the golf, and there are still lots of stands of uh, uh, mixed um, hardwood and softwood. Uh, the, uh, a disc golf course on this property would increase access to a publicly owned resource. Uh, there's little to no extra maintenance because of the format of this property and the fact that it's already being maintained by the town. And there's potential for tournaments by expanding to Huckleberry Rock across the road. Kevin, you're at, at seven minutes. So I'll ask you I'm maybe... sorry, I'll, I'll wrap this up real quick. Uh, the fish hatchery is the second location that we've identified. Uh, there's 10 safe playable acres there. Uh, it increases again, more access to the park uh, other than the trail that currently runs along the river. It's close to Watt Public School and the highway and it will bolster Northern uh, Township recreation. Uh, both locations we've identified would be ideal for recreational or micro style courses. Recreational courses will serve a wider variety of skill level and are more likely to attract out of town players, but micro courses can still be valuable assets, introducing new players to the sport. It has a very cost, uh, uh, cost a very attractive cost benefit offering, not only because player equipment is so economical, but because the sport is playable by such a wide swath of age groups. Uh, a number of factors like design type, uh, the density of the forest, uh, equipment and teapad selection will all have uh, impacts on the overall cost, but generally the cost for these style of courses is relatively low. I'd like to finish off by just describing how we market uh, these courses once they're installed. Our job doesn't stop once the course is installed. 
I, in the last year, I have created a destination marketing organization called Disc Golf Muskoka, which is currently promoting Muskoka as a destination for di uh, traveling disc golf. Uh, courses that we produce are submitted to all major directories, including UDISC, the ODSA, PDGA, and Disc Golf Course Review. Courses are promoted on help design and fluent disc design uh, websites and are announced in the Disc Golfer magazine, which goes to all PDGA members. And we also help to create a uh, grand opening tournament to uh, launch the course to the general public. Lastly, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to present what we believe would be a great new asset to the Township of Muskoka Lakes. Uh, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, a great new asset to the Township of Muskoka Lakes, one that is active, inclusive, and affordable. Please let us design your next disc golf course. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have, but I believe Councillor Nishikawa has a few things to add if I can pass the mic to her. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Go, go ahead, Councillor Nishikawa. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you for giving a little bit of a leeway to this presentation. Um, quite frankly, uh, Kevin and I have been talking about this since uh, 2019 or even sooner, I think. Um, and I, I, the economics just make perfect sense. Um, it was interesting. I was at a uh, curling function up in Huntsville and spoke with some senior women that were really excited um, when I had ta started talking about the disc golf. Oh, we go to Bracebridge and we do the, and, you know, and honestly, they were from the Skeleton Lake area. So, and my goal has always been from um, the trails perspective is to try to find more um, activity things available for the northern part of our township. So again, I, I really enjoyed the presentation, Kevin, and I, I hope that and we, what we will do going forward is we will bring this back to our, our trails committee uh, and um, for a further discussion. There are actually a couple of other locations that are very ideal as well, including the trail system behind Walkers Point Community Center. And we, what we didn't hear from Kevin, because I'd asked him not to discuss this, but what I had found uh, in our discussions is that this might, per course, might be a $15,000 ticket. Um, very affordable, very, very affordable, but brings a lot to the municipality. So again, thank you for the presentation. And I think we um, uh, will we'll get more from the committee in the future. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, I think as, as chair of that committee, I appreciate your words and certainly would suggest and hope that, that this thing uh, continues to uh, have life. And uh, I, I guess it doesn't get wrapped up into the whole recreation parks, trails and, and facilities master plan at this early stage, but certainly uh, to your indications, uh, Chair Nishikawa of that committee, that's great. So thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Thank you, and through you, this is the first I've heard of this, so I've had just a couple of quick questions, but I am always glad to find out there are other sports I can take up and suck at, so uh, uh, <laughs> it sounds kind of intriguing. Uh, two quick questions. If you overlay disc golf on a traditional uh, ball golf course, uh, can you play them simultaneously, or do you have to have, like, disc day and then golf day, uh, ball day? That's number one. Number two, and I'll, then I'll, I'll go mute again. Uh, what's the pace of play here compared to a, a traditional golf game? So uh, to answer your question uh, and through you, Councillor uh, Zavitz, um, the, uh, they are very compatible. Uh, like I said, there are a number of golf courses in Southern Ontario that have very successfully integrated both sports. You can play them both at the same time with proper design that takes the uh, pace of play and the direction of play into account uh, where people are either hitting their balls or throwing their discs. Uh, obviously comes into play uh, when we design around the, the safety aspects of the sport. But yes, absolutely, they are very compatible uh, and are already in use in Southern Ontario. Um, and then uh, second, uh, and, and I'm sorry, can you remind me what your second question was? I think you hit the both. It's pace of play and whether you can have both a ball game and a disc game going on at the same time. I'll, I'll just address the pace of play then as well. So a typical, at least at, a, at our course here in Huntsville, which is a recreational length 18 hole golf course, um, we generally take about an hour and a half, uh, at most two hours for a foursome to play a full 18 holes. 
So it's actually quite a bit faster than playing a, uh, a round of golf. Uh, I know that uh, playing golf on some of the courses around here, I'm, uh, I'm getting stuck for four and almost five hours uh, playing a full round of 18. So this actually does have the opportunity to push a lot more people through the property uh, in concert with golf, uh, assuming that uh, there aren't too many golfers uh, ahead of them. Good. I think, too, it also answers the, the year-round uh, piece <laughs> to our township. That's a bit of a puzzle for us, and certainly this is one of the most viable solutions I've seen. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Councillor Mazan, and then we'll move on. Uh, thank you, and through you, I was uh, happy to see your present today, uh, presentation today, Mr. Farley. Uh, I actually had a chance to play myself on one of those courses uh, that have been popping up around. It is an interesting and year-round sport, and it is accessible, which uh, all points to a good recreation. Um, I, I think as far as next steps, I just would want to be sure that as the Parks and Trails Committee is contemplating this, um, that's if there's a needed link with any of the ideas coming through in the, the long-term planning and the rec recreational master plan, just that there is a, a, an open dialogue happening. Thank you. Good. And I think as a result of these these kinds of discussions in the public, that will be that will be assured to happen. So thank you for that, uh, Kevin. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I think we'll take that certainly under advisement, and uh, you know look forward to more discussion on that in the future days uh, ahead. So thank you for that. Have a great holiday. I'm going to now move on to item 4D. Um, I'm going to invite Murray Dixon onto the, uh, onto the floor here regarding uh, issues facing Skeleton Lake uh, water access property owners. And then right after um, Murray, we'll also be talking with uh, Liz Beatty is going to make a presentation, uh, president of Fairhaven Island on Lake Muskoka um, in a similar vein. And this relates to water access only, uh, both water and uh, land parking uh, issues. So first of all, Murray, welcome. Are you here, sir? You can get dialed in. Okay, welcome. Okay, we're going to put that presentation up on the screen. There you go. Murray, if you would turn on your camera and unmute. After these two presentations and just pre our public works report, uh, we'll uh, take a break. So maybe around 10, 15, we'll uh, take a break and then press on. Okay, so. Before Murray, we start. Yeah. There we go. Mary, welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, before we start, could you uh, advance the slide just so I know that it's working? Okay, there you go. So, oh, I see. Okay, okay, very good. Okay, very okay. good. Yeah. So, the first slide. My name is Murray Dixon. I'm um, um, presenting on behalf of over 30 uh, Skeleton Lake property owners. Um, next spring, some Skeleton Lake property owners may not be able to access their properties. And this is a crisis. Next slide, please. It, this, this started in late August when the Muskoka Village Harbor Marina announced that they would be permanently closing the marina as of the end of October. So suddenly over 30 families faced the prospect of having no mainland docking and no mainland parking next season. Now there is another marina on the lake, the Skeleton Lake Marina, but that's already at full capacity and they have a wait list. Next slide, please. So who are we or who is affected? Well, as you can see, this is a map of Skeleton Lake and the dots are water access cottages. The red and green dots are water access cottages. Um, the red dots are the property owners who are affected by the closure of the Muskoka Village Harbor Marina. And I'm representing that group. Next slide, please. So we know uh, that we need to get mainland parking and mainland docking within the next few months. And we really have two options. One are the commercial marinas and the second are public access sites. 
So for the commercial marinas, the Muskoka Village Harbor has actually told us recently that they will be opening next summer, but at a greatly reduced capacity. As far as the uh, Skeleton Lake Marina goes, any day now they will be uh, submitting an application to expand both their parking and their docking. We strongly support this application and we hope that the township can expedite it so that we at least get the expanded parking by next spring. In terms of the public access, um, I, I should stress that this is an interim solution only. This is only for a year or two that we're suggesting. What we want to do is we want to go to public access sites with your township staff and assess the possibility of docking and parking at each site. We want to set up a plan and we want to implement that plan by the spring. We also would like um, a permit parking system. I know the township has looked at permit parking before, but we feel this is an excellent way of not only controlling the parking at these sites, but also bringing in revenue that's necessary to expand and, and expand the parking and the docking at these sites, the public access sites. But overall, we need overnight parking and overnight docking at public access sites. Next slide, please. So this, no, so where are these public access sites? Well, this again is a map of Skeleton Lake and you'll see that there are five dots numbered one to five. In the next few slides, I will be focusing on sites one to four, the public access sites, because these sites are in the township of Muskoka Lakes. Site five is in Huntsville. Next slide, please. So this is the first site. It's a small site, uh, Bert, uh, Bert Sims Road. And we think we can, it can accommodate about two boats and two car parking spots. Next site, slide please. This site is uh, at Skeleton Lake Road 5. It's a larger site. We think we can get in four boat, uh, park four boats at a uh, uh, pole dock. And we also think that there's parking available for four, maybe six cars in a reasonable parking lot. Next slide, please. This is Skeleton Lake Road 3. This is, a, this is the largest site, public access site. We think we can get eight cars parked in this site. And along the south shore, the right side of your screen, we think we can park some boats. Next slide, please. This, I, I included this slide to show that we're not only going to these sites to look at, at, at the possibilities, but we're also taking aerial photographs and making diagrams to try to optimize the parking and the uh, docking at each of these sites. Next slide, please. This is our final site at Skeleton Lake Road 2. It already has a large public dock. Um, we think we can add perhaps two finger docks to extend, um, expand the park, park, um, docking at this site. There's no parking area really, uh, but we are exploring possibilities up uh, Skeleton Road 2 for parking. So next slide, please. In conclusion, we know that we only have a few months to come up with solutions and we need to work with your staff to make sure that by the spring, there are parking and docking facilities for people at skeleton at the public access um, sites. We think that the best, we, we, I know we would like to have um, implement a permit parking system. We think this is an excellent system. As I said, not only to control the parking at these sites, but also to bring in revenue. And I think it would be a good solution for not only Skeleton Lake, area, but uh, the rest of this go where I know you're facing uh, parking issues. Okay, Mary, and thank finally, you. Get you to wrap up. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Uh, finally, um, it's the Skeleton Lake Marina expansion. We hope you could expedite uh, the approval process so that we could at least get uh, car parking in, in the spring. 
we are doing everything possible to, uh, we're these are the interim solutions that we're presenting. We're also looking at long-term solutions. So we're doing everything we can possibly do to uh, avert this crisis, but we do need your help. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I would ask um, for the full screen again, thank you for that presentation. Thanks for coming forward today, representing the public uh, on this topic. Um, I would ask uh, Director Becking of the four, location cited by uh, Murray on the map of Skelton Lake. Are those all uh, township Muskoka Lakes supported docks, ramps, or any of them? Or Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm only familiar with the Skelton Lake Road 3 and the Burt Sims uh, situation. The other two, uh, I'm afraid I don't have any knowledge of. Uh, certainly, I'd be happy to try and investigate uh, the matter further and see if there's any opportunities, if that's Please. the wish of the committee. Yeah. Can I can I say something? Yeah. Um, Skelton Lake Road Five. That's a road allowance, and um, that in that particular case, and of course, there's a dock at Skelton Lake Road Two, which is a government dock. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, committee. Any comments? Any questions? Uh, any statements? Okay, so, um, you know, I, I know that we've had men, much, much discussion on this, Murray, uh, through, the, through the summer of uh, sure. 2021. Um, transportation master plan has been identified as the hopeful panacea for some of this, but certainly what it will do more than anything is cause this group, this township to, you know, relook, rethink, um, and, and consider different options for water access, water access and do what we can and I think that's the operative word. We'll we we will do what we can uh, at Good this point, point in time. What I would suggest that you brought this forward. Um, I suppose with uh, a consensus here that uh, we would look at this as general finance, um, perhaps more specifically to your plight um, next month. If, if uh, Director Becking would, you know, bring a, bring a report forward on in terms of how many actual public docks there are there that we currently own and operate and manage. Uh, I think that's a vital piece of this puzzle. Uh, I'd like to understand that before we went much further with, uh, with anything. So we'll take it under advisement at this point in time. I'm gonna ask certainly Councillor Edwards and Councillor Roberts uh, for their comments, not in that order. Sorry, Councillor Roberts, you were first. And then uh, we'll ask Liz Beatty to come on on a very similar issue. Okay, Councillor Roberts, go ahead. And thank you, Chair, and through you, um, this is a, uh, an issue that is, is facing 37 property owners over there. We are on record um, at our previous meetings on, uh, on townships um, capacity to help out. I would look forward to a staff report that not only talks about the locations, but sort of talks about um, some of the other uh, suggestions um, that are in the presentation so we can take a look at this. And then, and then lastly, um, I am, I'm aware there, there is no application put forth um, for the, uh, the, the Skeleton Lake Marina for expansion. Um, I ask that, um, that uh, Director uh, Pink could do whatever was in his power to expedite, but not circumvent the process. Because I've heard, sure. I have heard from um, uh, other Scout and Lake people that are, are not um, supportive of the expansion of that current of marina. So everyone has to hear. Sure. All right. So be heard. All right. Thank you. Sure. So thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Edwards, and then the CAO will have a comment. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I basically uh, agree with Council Roberts. We have to expedite this and, and, and try and help people out. I don't know the answer. But one of the things we, we have to, to look at in the future is marinas and that. Uh, I don't know what the zoning. Uh, so maybe uh, put something in that it can't be rezoned because this is vital and that. And we, we, we just can't have, say, all of a sudden, uh, Wallace Bay said, oh, we're, we're closing and another one closes. And that uh, you know, th these are, uh, are 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 vital to our our. Uh, 
idle cottages, everything else like that. So, you know, we have to do something and we have to do something quick and whatever we can do to support it. I'd like to see a staff report on that. If we could help out temporarily, I would be in full agreement with that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call on the Thank CEO. You. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, members of committee and to the delegate. Um, with respect to this matter, uh, I would note to committee that um, you've previously received a staff report on this issue more generally as it applies across the township. And you'll recall that we, at the time we discussed um, updating the official plan to be more supportive of uh, waterfront landings and individually as two sides to the equation, the land side and the water access side. We also talked about a transportation master plan. So in this instance, while I appreciate that Mr. Murray has given a lot of thought to this, it's very evident in terms of his presentation and he's looking at solutions specifically for this area. I think solutions need to be thought of more broadly across the municipality in terms of the strategy. While some of these solutions that he's suggesting may fit therein, uh, I think we still need to be mindful of that. That said, um, I, I, this is certainly the first time that I'm hearing of this issue. Uh, I think that perhaps prior to a staff report being uh, brought back, uh, further conversation with Mr. Murray, Mr. Becking, and perhaps Mr. Pink or Mr. Sharp should occur with respect to some of the specifics so we get a better understanding of the entire situation there. Uh, so I would suggest that that uh, staff meeting occur and then we can uh, come back to committee after that with uh, sort of um, a better understanding and perhaps some uh, some further thoughts. Thank you. That would be excellent. That'd be excellent. Really appreciate it. Okay, good. So clearly, clearly we care. We understand the plight sure. um, and I appreciate the CAO's words. Um, with, with that, uh, Murray Dixon, I will uh, ask you just to, uh, I guess, just to go off the camera and we're gonna invite um, Liz Beatty uh, to attend. And again, she's the Fairhaven Island uh, Cottagers uh, Association president. And she has some commentary and uh, it's very specifically related to uh, island and water access. So I see that she's connecting to audio. Um, Liz, welcome. Good morning. You have uh, five minutes. Just connecting now. I believe she was. Well, she was in the car. Um, Liz, are you going to be able to have a camera on, or are you just going to be audio? Uh, you're muted, Liz. Yeah. There we go. Uh, my apologies. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my apologies for my Caledon internet. You'll have to just look at my static photo. Um, okay. Go ahead. Mayor Harding, committee members, uh, yeah, thanks for your time this morning and for the opportunity to come back and speak with you. Uh, my name is Liz Beattie. I'm president of the Fairhaven Island Association. Uh, perhaps relevant to my comments today, I'm also a fourth generation Islander on Lake Muskoka a veteran journalist covering sustainable tourism, culture, and recreation. I work for National Geographic, Canadian Geographic, The Walrus, UK Guardian, SiriusXM, Destination Canada, among others. And I've covered Muskoka for not a few of these platforms. Um, I also consult for my home region of Caledon on their master tourism plan and how that intersects with parking, traffic, and trans transportation issues. So I'm, I'm here today not to rehash the Bamora sparking decision, rather I'm here to spotlight uh, what, we can, what can be learned from that process and how we can use that learning to move forward in a new area, era of planning, uh, one that reflects the place of water access residents among all Muskoka ratepayers. Um, but to seize the future, you know, we have to learn from the past. Uh, looking back briefly, uh, my fellow Islanders and I recognize some key issues and inaccuracies uh, in the Bemoris report and, and, and a few of the ensuing discussions by committee members. And absolutely not because anybody wasn't absolutely professional or intent on doing the right thing. Nobody saw any hidden agendas. In, indeed, weeks later, uh, I made a follow-up call to Director Becking, he took my call right away and was totally forthcoming, even with information I might have used 
to argue against his position today. Um, he was the consummate professional, as everyone says he is. Uh, the point is, is we're in a new era. Uh, that unspoken agreement, the township doesn't bother water access people and we don't bother them, that's gone. Um, but while new rules and enforcement may be needed for everybody, we need to as well acknowledge our, our township doesn't have well-established planning principles and understanding uh, of issues that apply to water access cottagers. They're just not baked into the existing planning framework and um, you know, decision maker priorities. Uh, so as such, there are just blind spots in the process. And as with any organization, without all the stakeholder voices included, it's impossible to know what you don't know. Um, it's impossible to see all those blind spots. So again, nobody, absolutely nobody here is the bad guy. Uh, but with all this in mind, now seems the ideal time for not only to initiate a master transportation plan, but one guided by uh, a committee, including representatives from all key public stakeholders, including water access people. Uh, it's a big complex job ahead, retrofitting over 100 years of water access development, resident investment, lifestyle expectations, uh, all with sound, fair planning principles and within the bigger transportation picture. So my point today is let us help you consider what you may not know to consider. <laughs> Let us help you along with all the other key stakeholders get it right. Now, some of you may say, hey, we've heard several of your delegations uh, from water access people. We understand your concerns. Uh, and yes, you certainly have heard several delegations from Islanders and water access people. But I think we all know delegation is not dialogue. Uh, delegation at its best is a broad strokes way of introducing general ideas and concerns to the public discussion, like today. But here's what we all know who've successfully worked through big complex initiatives with conflicting interests. The real work begins when everyone sits down at the same table to find common ground, to put a finer point on our respective priorities and, and to seek meaningful compromise. It's about listening, connection, drilling down to nuances, collaboration. And that doesn't happen in a two to five minute presentation. So again, in the spirit of the uh, impressive recreation parks, trails and facilities master plan report and with its guiding committee of public stakeholders, uh, I propose that the township now tackles a master transportation plan and with a similar guiding committee of representatives of all the key, uh, key public stakeholders, and specifically including water access cottagers among them. Uh, I feel very certain that we can do amazing things retooling TML's planning framework to reflect more fully the very complex 21st realities and interests of everyone, including water access people like me. And here's what I know too, goodwill is the cornerstone. And that's why I'm asking today that committee members here, you know, set out to set the example of that goodwill and set in motion, uh, not just the development of a TML master uh, transportation plan, but one guided by a committee of public stakeholders, including specifically water access rate pairs. Uh, the preceding presentation, I think, just underscores the need for this. Uh, I humbly put up my hand here and offer my time and expertise to serve on such a committee. Thanks again to everyone for your time today. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Great presentation, great words. I'm going to call on uh, Director Becking, who will be the custodian of said plan, Transportation Master Plan in 2022, and then a uh, comment from the CAO. Uh, Ken, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the deputy is correct. We are planning to do a transportation master plan in, in uh, 2022, or at least initiate the process. Um, probably uh, the soonest I would see this moving forward would be the end of the second quarter or early into the third quarter of, of uh, 2022. Um, to be honest with you, I truly have not set my mind to, to uh, how best to move forward with the initiative. Uh, certainly um, 
public consultation and public involvement is a, a, a key component of, of, uh, of the process. Um, and certainly uh, we'd be happy to uh, take uh, Ms. Beattie's interests in, into consideration uh, as we move forward on that. Thank you. Uh, CAO, do you want to, I'm just going to mute myself here. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I think my initial comments with respect to the Skeleton Lake matter, um, I alluded to the notion of, of certainly balance from the perspective of uh, the planning policies, uh, the notion of uh, balancing the interest between mainland uh, uh, property owners and uh, water access um, property owners, and, and the notion of ensuring that the planning tests and the planning policies address both issues equally so that one doesn't have a sort of a, a monopoly on on the policy intent uh, over the other. Uh, I, I would agree with Mr. Becking's comments with respect to the transportation master plan. Um, engagement and ensuring that all, all parties are heard is extremely important and uh, I think staff will uh, take this into consideration and uh, we'll move forward with hopefully uh, upon uh, council approval of the budget we'll be able to move forward with the transportation master plan this year. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. I see no hands. I want to thank you, Liz, for uh, coming forward and putting your hand up and uh, duly noted for the record. Um, we see you and we acknowledge you. So thank you for your time today. Uh, I think Murray to Murray Dixon, if he's still listening, um, I do expect staff would uh, reach out and contact and have that meeting uh, set as, as soon as possible, as indicated by our CAO. So there's that topic. It's exactly 1025. I think we'll maybe take a 10 minute break, perhaps until uh, 1040 and uh, 1035 at least, and come on back and we'll uh, get at item 5A, Public Works. Thank you.
Okay. Committee, we're just waiting for a few folks to come back. We're all refreshed and ready to go. I will be in just a few moments calling on Director of Public Works Ken Becking for his report, item 5A, um, core and non-core infrastructure roadmap. Uh, we just need one more person to come on the screen. And there we go. Thank you. There they are. Okay, with that, uh, Director Becking, I'm going to give you the floor, sir, and uh, talk to us about core and non-core infrastructure roadmap, your report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, and uh, members of committee. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, the report before you is uh, is for information purposes only. Um, what I'm uh, doing here is uh, attempting to to create a, a bit of a framework for discussion of what will be several uh, initiatives that is going to come before you over in the course of the next several months. Um, just as a reminder, um, in, in my world, in our world, um, we talk in terms of core and non-core um, assets. These are defined uh, by the, uh, an Ontario regulation with respect to asset management, uh, regulation in uh, 588.17. Um, core assets are, uh, are very narrowly defined, um, and basically it's, it's the traditional assets, uh, water, sewer, roads, bridges is, is the essence of it. Um, everything else is considered non-core, um, and core, uh, the, the implied, um, Understanding is that core are essential, they're mandatory, uh, they take precedence over non-core. And as we go through the various uh, plans and master plans and so forth over the next few months, I would ask you to keep those, uh, keep that definition and keep those distinctions in mind um, because obviously, um, uh, while I, I know that there are going to be a number of priorities uh, that committee and council uh, will want to uh, to ensure that we that we uh, address and and give priority to the reality, however, is that the core assets must take precedence. And and uh, so uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, that's the essence of the report. Um, I will be bringing forward uh, to you a number of, as I've said, plans and studies over the course of the next uh, many months, and uh, and uh, we'll will I'm sure have uh, very fulsome discussions on all of them as we progress. So, if there are any questions, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Otherwise, thank you for your attention. Thank you. I found it very helpful. Very helpful, very insightful, especially where we are right now. And uh, as you say, a building block for the future. So thank you for that. Uh, committee, any thoughts, interests, concerns, comments? Okay, see, oh, good thumbs up, there we go. Uh, I have a resolution uh, to re read here, moved by Councillor Nishikawa, seconded by Councillor Bridgman, be it resolved that staff report PW-2021-029 regarding core and non-core infrastructure roadmap be received. All those in favor, call the vote. Yeah. Good, thank you. Carrie, thank you committee. And thank you, Director Becking. Um, Okay, so that's it for public works this time. That's very interesting. Usually there's quite a few. <laughs> Item 6A, uh, we're gonna call on Chriselle. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor uh, Jaguas, sir, go ahead. No, thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I had trouble getting my hand up. I just had a, cur a question for the director. Um, he indicated because we're, we have water in our area, our wharfs, uh, considered to be part of roads and bridges, or are they in the non-core? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, I would, the, the, the definition of water uh, deals with potable water, 
the, the production and distribution of potable water, uh, which uh, of course is under uh, district jurisdiction. Uh, so it does not figure into, into, uh, into the township's um, um, book of business, if you will. Um, as far as wharfs and, and uh, public accesses to water and so forth, that would be considered a recreational and therefore non-core. Even though a supplementary, even though they are, there are water access properties that use those to access the, possibly their, their place. So you would still call them non-core. Okay, thank you. That is correct, Good. Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other comments, uh, read that. We're, we'll move on now to Chrishell uh, has a report, report on 26 uh, license application McGee, roll number 4-19-026. Chrishell, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, committee. Uh, the township has received a license agreement application to recognize an existing driveway that is encroaching on a portion of an original road allowance. Based on staff comments, it is recommended that tentative approval be given subject to the noted conditions. With that being said, I will turn it back to the chair. Good, thank you, Chriselle. Any comments uh, from the committee? Any thoughts? No? Okay, seeing none. Uh, moved by Councillor Jaglord, seconded by Councillor Kelly, be it result of the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council that license agreement application number LA-04-21 McGee be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that a draft numbered reference plan of survey be prepared and provided to the clerk for review within one year of the date of this conditional approval. Two, that the township be in receipt of the following from the acting solicitor. Uh, one, which is a confirmation of a title search that the applicant is the owner of a budding land and that the encroachment is located on township land. And two, a draft license agreement to the satisfaction of the township. Item number three in the body, that the applicants uh, provide proof of liability insurance covering the encroachments in the minimum amount of $2 million with the township named as additional insured. And item four, payment of any applicable fees related to the preparation of the license agreement, including but not limited to the solicitor's time and disbursements, as well as confirmation applicable uh, property taxes have been paid up to date. All those in favor? Terry, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna hand the floor back to Chrishell again for um, a sale of original road allowance application, Alexander, roll number 9-12-034-03. Chrishell, Chrishell, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the township has received an application for the sale of a portion of an original road allowance from an abutting landowner. Based on staff comments, it is recommended that tentative approval be given subject to the noted conditions. Um, and with that being said, I will turn it back to the Chair. Good, thank you. Committee, any thoughts? Okay, I'll read this resolution. Uh, moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved, the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council that original road allowance application ORA slash 04 slash 21 Alexander be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the township be in receipt of correspondence from the landowner of roll number 9-12-033 abutting the portion of the original road allowance to be closed within 60 days of the conditional approval of this application. The correspondent shall confirm or waive their interest in the northerly 33 foot portion of the original road allowance. Two, upon confirmation of the landowner of roll number 9-12-033, confirming or waiving their interest in acquiring the 33 foot portion of the original road allowance to be closed, a corresponding draft numbered reference plan of survey shall be prepared and provided to the clerk for review within one year of the date of this conditional approval. Three, that the township be in receipt of the following from the acting solicitor. Uh, one, confirmation that public notice of the proposed disposition was published pursuant to township policy C-LS-06. 
Two, confirmation that the District of Muskoka and other applicable agencies have no concerns with the proposed disposition. And that three, a road closing bylaw, a declaration of surplus resolution and any related necessary documentation to affect the disposition. And four, uh, payment of any applicable fees for the land costs, solicitor's time and disbursements, as well as confirmation of applicable property taxes have been paid up to date. I'll call the question. All those in favor? Good, thank you, it's carried. Okay, thank you, Chriselle. I'm going to now, uh, item uh, 6C, I'm gonna call on uh, Mark Donaldson, our Director of Financial Services uh, for his presentation on the 2020 uh, development charges. And then at that, uh, within the body of his report, he'll then move on to the OCIF report um, as well that was documented in the uh, supplementary agenda. So with that, Mark, I'll give you the floor, sir. Welcome. And uh, let's hear about uh, the 2020 development charges. Thank you. Go ahead. Morning, Chair and members of committee. Um, so this report with respect to development charges is an information report uh, required under the legislation. Uh, we are required to present a summary of the development charge activity. Uh, this would be for the year 2020. Uh, which was completed as part of our financial statements last uh, last quarter, uh, earlier this quarter. And um, I guess the only point I would make uh, with respect to this report is there were no disbursements in 2020 and staff will continue to look at projects as we move forward in terms of eligibility that uh, development charges should be applied to fund those projects uh, related to growth in the township. And uh, on that, I'd happy happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, committee, thoughts? The report is as it is. Uh, it's in front of you all. It's a matter of the public record now. Um, I do have a resolution to read in that regard. Um, moved by Councillor Roberts, uh, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa, be it resolved that the development charges fund reserve report dated December 15th, 2021 be received. So I'll call that question. All those in favor? Good, that's carried, thank you. Thank you, committee. Okay, Mark, uh, sir, you go right ahead. You've got a report um, as indicated on our uh, supplementary agenda uh, regarding the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, OCIF. Go ahead. Which one? Oh, so, well, we should. Okay, Mark, are you, uh, Mr. Mark, are you comfortable with uh, doing the OCIF report first before we call uh, a resolution to suspend the rules of procedure? Uh, I am at the call of the chair. I'm happy to proceed. Okay. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the, uh, the report before committee uh, is just a follow up. Uh, the province of Ontario announced uh, last week that uh, it would be increasing its uh, funding to uh, rural and northern municipalities under the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund, uh, as announced in the fall economic statement this year. Uh, the township will be receiving uh, an increase of three hundred and twenty four thousand and seventeen dollars in 2022 over its 2021 allocation. So the total received will be five hundred twenty thousand one hundred ninety four. Uh, alternative put before committee uh, for consideration is with the increase in this funding from the province, there is an opportunity through which uh, the, the, the township can continue to contribute to reserves and fund reserves uh, and use this incremental funding from this grant uh, in place of funds that would have been received in the reserves through the levy. So the, re the alternative that's before committee for consideration would be to maintain the level of funding to reserves, but replace a portion of it from the levy with this increased amount of funding from the province and uh, maintain our, our level of funding as, as presented in the budget or 
significant or materially uh, that thereof. So um, I put that before committee for discussion. Good, thank you. Okay, I think what we can do is we could uh, park that as a as a, a piece that will come forward in our next round of discussion. Uh, but pre me uh, re reading that resolution, I'll ask uh, Councillor Jaguars. Go ahead, sir. Give your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair. Are we discuss. Uh, I'd like to discuss one part of this report. Is it okay to do it now, or please do absolutely. Go okay, ahead. so. So there's, a, there's an alternative section in the report and uh, that alternative section refers to, um, to something that I'd like clarification for, on from the director if possible. It was my under, it, that um, alternative indicates that in order to reduce the contribution to reserves to the 2021 level, there would be a reduction of 387,200. I was under the impression, Director, that we were adding 3.5% or 440,000 to the previous year levy. I wonder if you could just clarify if I've just misunderstood that and that um, in fact, the, the, the level of reserve fund contributions before the 3.5% was actually lower than the previous year. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, through you, Chair. So <clears throat> the amount of the increase in the budget as presented and approved by the General Finance Committee on November 23rd with adjustments was an increase of 387,200 over the 2021 contribution to reserves. The 440,000 you're referring to was an estimate that was provided in the original guidelines, um, but this 387,200 is the amount that's currently in the draft budget. Okay, so the 3.5 is, is actually a lesser number. It's actually 3. Point, uh, a smaller number. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I can, yes, that's correct. It's 3.1 3. is the number. Okay. Okay, committee, very good. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to read this resolution moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be it resolved that staff report FIN 2021 023 regarding the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund be received for information purposes. All those in favor? Good. Thank you. It's carried. Thank you, committee. Okay, I'm going to read. Um, a resolution, oh, sorry, Councilor Mazan, you go ahead before I suspend the rules, uh, procedural rules, go ahead. Oh, okay, good, thank you. Um, uh, moved by Councilor Mazan, seconded by Councilor Kelly, be it resolved that pursuant to section 2.3.2, .2 of the Township's procedural bylaw 2019-79, as amended, the rules of procedure are hereby suspended for the duration of the 2022 draft Township operating and capital budget discussion, and that they be reinstated at the conclusion of the discussion. All those in favor? Good. That's it. Thank you. I'm just rolling along. Okay, so here we are. Um, our format will be here, item 6E. Uh, I will call on um, Director of Financial Services, Mark Donaldson, to, to take us through his... Uh, his latest report here and now, I would say as well that his report will be posted to the, um, the township website uh, now, essentially. And um, that's where it will be for reference for yourselves and uh, certainly the public. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mark Donaldson uh, to walk us through the 2022 budget, I suppose, uh, update, if you will. Thank you, go ahead. The screen is not going to allow me to go to PowerPoint mode, but I will uh, I will endeavor to walk through this presentation in its current format. Hopefully everybody can see it. I think we can. Okay. Thank you, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so the staff report presented provides details in response to several areas of concern submitted in writing to council 
raised by speakers at the special council meeting held on November 30th. Um, on behalf of the Muskoka Ratepayers Association and the Muskoka Lakes Association. Uh, the report breaks these items into three major themes. The first being uh, reserves and reserve balances, and the second being enhancing services, and the third being budget tax increases. So I'll speak to the reserves item in a moment. On the enhancing services concern, staff have noted that the two new reserves for climate change and community improvement will further initiatives previously endorsed by council. And with respect to staffing, uh, staff site back to the original project list that was included in the budget package November 3rd uh, that consisted of a list of ongoing projects that aim to support the priorities set by council. Uh, on the budget tax increase, the staff have noted in the report, there are continuous efforts underway to improve budgeting and forecasting and to enhance transparency and accountability for the public. To that end, a greater focus was placed on historical results in developing the 2022 operating budget, while being prudent with respect to cost pressures beyond the township's control in areas such as insurance and other consumable materials such as, or as consumable such as fuel and building materials. This presentation will be made available for on the website as the chair had indicated. So for those who, who may not be able to fully see the, the details here, um, I'd like to take committee back to our audited financial statements uh, for 2020 that were presented earlier this year to committee. In the staff report at the October meeting to committee, it was noted that some of the accumulated surplus including amounts from past years prior to 2020, was unassigned to a specific reserve and that staff will evaluate the level of unassigned funds held in the accumulated surplus and report back with a recommendation to committee on additional amounts to be transferred to reserves from this account. Subsection 294, uh, so subse section 290, subsection four of the Municipal Act requires that surplus funds at the end of each year be placed into a reserve or carried forward into the next year's budget. Staff have identified this issue and are taking corrective action in this regard. The recently approved reserves policy requires council's approval to place funds in reserves. It's important to note that the financial statements are audited in accordance with public sector accounting standards, not the Municipal Act, and therefore are correct as presented. On this balance sheet, the reported cash in the December 31st, 2020 financial statements is $19,235,818. Disclosed is a breakdown of that allocation of cash $12,906,307 is related to reserves that were reported in the financial statements at your end. $2,097,046 has been received in advance for 2021 taxes, including the provincial and district share, which are reported in the liabilities section of the balance sheet. And $85,041 are accumulated surplus funds attributed to the library and a small capital fund, which has been unchanged since 2014. The remainder of this cash balance of $4,147,424 held is not allocated to any specific item on this balance sheet. It is included in the accumulated surplus. As well, I will note that the restricted cash portion of $3,640,212 is also reported in the liabilities section as deferred revenue. These amounts relate to the obligatory reserves that are disclosed in note three to the financial statements. Note six of the financial statement shows a breakdown of the township's accumulated surplus reported on the balance sheet of $75,400,829. The accumulated surplus is the net assets of the township, assets less liabilities at the reporting date. At December 31st, it's comprised of the $12,906,307 of reserves that are not shown on this slide, but are on the previous page in the audited financial statements, future recoveries, which is our debt to a uh, municipal debt, and surpluses. Within the surplus section, our statements include an item, general surplus, 
with an amount of $5,801,062. On this slide, a breakout of this general surplus is shown. Again, members will see the unallocated cash amount of $4,147,424. The remaining items are what is termed in accounting as non-cash items, assets and liabilities that at the date of reporting are not settled as cash. This table is table one from page four of the report. I would highlight for committee that while the total reserves in the opening balance currently noted is $15,474,267, noted here, is before any adjustment for any unallocated cash as reported. The amount identified as discretionary capital in this column are the primary reserves used to fund the 10-year capital plan. While obligatory reserves such as development charges and parkland dedication, which is in this column here, can also be used to fund capital in accordance with legislative guidance, the table shows that in the current reserve forecast that 97% of levied contributions to reserves are added to the reserves within the discretionary capital category and 84% of the draws from reserves over 10 years labeled as requirements on this row here are labeled are come also from discretionary capital. Again, the reserve forecast as presented on November 30th as in the budget package for the special council meeting shown on this slide does not oh, yet include your, uh, form. Okay. That's us. Uh, yeah, you go ahead, sir. Just I'm okay. I'll let you know. Maybe, can you mind just restarting that one slide, that, that last slide? Just, you did break up a little. This one? The current, sorry, the current slide. Thank you. Okay, yeah. No, go ahead. So the reserve forecast is presented on November 30th as part of the budget package for the special, part of the package for the special council meeting does not yet include the $4,147,424 of unallocated cash. Staff are recommending at this time that this unallocated cash be added to the reserves for the 2021, in 2021 fiscal year in our actual results, which would increase the opening balance for 2022 by $4,147,424. The selected reserve would be the tax stabilization reserve, which is under discretionary operating. This would increase this opening balance that is circled from 15,474,267 to 19,621,691 dollars. Following council's meeting of January 12th to discuss the budget, a future report would be presented to allocate this added balance to other discretionary reserves, including the community improvement reserve and climate change reserve as been discussed as part of the budget discussions based on future needs. As well, staff will bring forward a report on a municipal best practice with regard to reserve management and recommend an update to the reserve, uh, reserve the township's reserve policy as appropriate. In closing, staff are identifying the future reports, which will serve to inform future capital requirements over the next 10 years and beyond for the township. The use of this information and direction of council will be critical in establishing the future funding needs from reserves. Again, I'll make this uh, presentation available on our, uh, on our agenda website. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to take them at this time. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. We we'll get back to the full screen. So I know there's going to be some questions, of course, some comments. I, I would say, uh, pre asking committee, I would say that uh, again, thanks, Mark, for the detailed explanation regarding your the unallocated surplus balance. 
noted in the 2020 uh, financial statements that was previously discussed by us. You know, we now have confirmed the amount is four million one hundred and forty seven thousand four hundred and twenty four dollars. At this time, I you know I would ask you as a committee, if you're in agreement with staff adding this amount to the tax stabilize, stabilization reserve. And uh, this would result in a revised opening balance of the reserve forecast contained in our draft budget. So just laying that framework out there, uh, Councillor uh, Kelly, you go ahead and then Councillor Bridgman. Well, thank you and through you. <clears throat> this is a lot to try and digest and wade through on zero notice. That having been said, I've got a long list of questions and we'll work through it. Um, <clears throat> I understand, uh, I don't even know where to begin. Um, if, I'm, if I followed it correctly, we're sitting with reserves at the end of last year, 15,474,000 uh, through the good work of, uh, uh, of our uh, director of, of, of Mark, uh, we've identified $4.147 million in additional unallocated funds. And I assume on top of that will be added, no, sorry, uh, those funds, as I understand it from, from uh, reading the Municipal Act, um, are to be brought into revenue in the year after the surplus is earned. And I assume from there, there can be a decision made, and I'm assuming the decision is made by council where it gets placed, whether it gets put into reserves or, or what else happens to it. So my first question is, what are our options? I, I, I hear somebody saying, let's put it into reserves. But my question is, if we choose to do something else, what's available to us? Uh, and, and rather than toggle back and forth, let me just give you a couple more questions because they're all related and then I'll stop. Um, in addition to 15 million 474, plus 4,147, I assume that we'll, I'm assuming, I don't know this, but I'll ask uh, uh, Director Donaldson, we probably forecast a surplus for the year 2021, which additionally will either be recognized as revenue or will be recognized as revenue and, and brought onto the books for 2022, and also must go through some tests to decide what we do with it, whether we allocate it to reserves or not. So. 19621169 is our current reserve level if we decide to take these funds 4147 and allocate them to reserves but we can't stop there we're going to have to deal with a I, I hope or i assume a reserve for this year that's a material difference a huge and material difference from everything that has been put in front of us as part of budget deliberations and I don't understand how we can move forward with any budget deliberations until we rewrite the uh, assumptions and, the, uh, and essentially the opening balance sheet and understand the reserves. Um, and I also have to ask one last question and then I'll stop. We have this tendency to earmark everything automatically. I'll put that into reserves. Is there a, is there a, a notional uh, how, how big do we want the reserves to get? Are they already uh, sufficient to cover anticipated um, to cover anticipated draws on capital? Uh, we're continuing to over the forecast, the ten-year forecast. I think we're budgeting uh, or forecasting somewhere between six and a half to seven or eight million dollars a year in additional reserve coverage. We're also budgeting or forecasting capital expenditures of slightly more than that. But we have this large cushion today of, four, I don't know what it is, 14 million or 15 million dollars. How big should that be? And, and uh, since we're essentially borrowing that money from our constituents, um, I, and I can't think of any other way to characterize it, we don't have any immediate use for it. We don't have any forecast use for it over the next 10 years. How much more do we want to take from the taxpayer? To build the cushion, um, you know, and, and uh, with no sort of definable identity or a way to identify how and when that thing will be forecast to be to be drawn down against. Um, but that's for now. That's all I have to ask. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, Mark, um, if you want to, obviously we'd, we're asking you to wade in here. Um, and we may ask the others as well for the, obviously their comments, but let's hear from you. If you can speak to Councillor Kelly's concerns in some way, shape or form. Sure, thank you, Chair. So I think to the first point, uh, what happens with the reserve? So under the Municipal Act, the reserve, there any surplus from a given year needs to either A, be rolled into a reserve. Sorry, so let me start again. So any surplus from a given year needs to either be rolled into a reserve, which is reported as an expense under the Municipal Act accounting. So not public sector accounting, but Municipal Act accounting, or it would be rolled forward into the following year's budget as a revenue item. So it would basically be carried forward into the following year. It's my understanding that historically that budgets have not been prepared that way for the township, that the amounts in a surplus at the end of every year have been rolled into reserve, but the option to roll it forward into a future budget is available to council should that be their, their wish. Um, with respect to the difference in the reporting, so again, you know, uh, when this item was identified in October, it was not quantified in the report, but it was identified that there was some portion of the general surplus that seemed to be available uh, and not have been rolled into a specific reserve. And that amount was not included in the previous schedules of the budget um, because we did not, there, there was no report before council to receive direction on how to treat that uh, money or to have it finally, to have it confirmed and quantified. Um, I would note that this discussion, if the money is to be moved from this unallocated to reserve is not an operating budget item because it would not have rolled into the budget. However, to the point I previously made, if it was to be rolled into the future budget, then obviously there would be some considerations there. Um, I think, and with respect to the level of reserve that we have, I think that was part of my uh, final comment. Um, more, in, more research and, and uh, investigation needs to happen by staff to come back um, with advice to council in terms of what is the appropriate level of reserves that we should have and what is a municipal best practice, what do other municipalities do, and how are, the, how are those amounts being reported. Um, I think every municipality probably has some unique characteristics to it, so I don't know that there is a, a carte blanche across the board rule of thumb, but I think there are certainly indications that can be uh, uh, used information and indicators that can be used to kind of guide that discussion. And the new reserve policy that was adopted earlier this year uh, has, a, has a piece in it, a paragraph that states that staff will make recommendation on reserve balances for council. So that is a, a coming piece. Um, I think that, I think that answers the questions you had. I don't think I missed any. Okay, good, thank you for that. And I'm gonna uh, call on the CAO for a comment as well, just to reinforce that, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I think coincident with the update to the, uh, to the reserve policy, we he also heard this morning um, from our consultant with respect to the non-core infrastructure or parts of it, the uh, recreation parks facilities master plan, along with the fire master plan, asset management plan, transportation master plan, all of those studies and documents will be used to refine the capital plan. So those are important key pieces. That's the, the expense side. So that will refine the capital plan and then we'll understand what we need to save for. And then that's the sweet spot with respect to reserves and contributions to reserves. So all of that information will feed in together as to how we move forward. And, and that's an exercise that will, be, that will be ongoing and there will be continual refinements, continuous improvement. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Bridgman and the, the mayor and then uh, Councillor Kelly, I'll get you back on here. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Zavitz. Um, just for my my understanding, what we're talking about is potentially 4.1 million plus the, I think it was the 324,000 that we've just gotten in from the government could potentially end up 
in reserves for this year. I just, I think, I think I'm getting that part correctly. So to Councillor Kelly's point, I need to see that in terms of on paper to see how that changes everything. I, I can't, um, I can't do much more except that. But my other thought as, as, uh, uh, CAO Hammond said, we've got some big reports coming in over the next year or two that are going to change. There's no question they're going to change what our 10-year forecast looks like. So my thought at this point, and I'm not married to it, but I thought I'd share it with you. I would like to see those updated numbers if we move those into reserve this year and then just put a hold on reserves and don't actually ask for an input from our constituents that still keeps it at a level that's reasonable and then moving forward, when we've got better information, we could actually uh, fine tune that and also find out what reserves in municipal world is compared to private industry. Because if it's one thing I've learned being on council is there's often a lot of differences between those, those two thought processes. So that's, that's, that's it for now. Thanks, Councillor, Thank or our Chair Zavitz. Thank you. And I want to just for clarification um, from you, uh, Councillor Bridgman, um, are you suggesting then, if you don't mind, just humor me, your impact on the as a tax increase, are you suggesting you'd be fine at three and a half? Or are you saying it's six and a half? Well, there therein lies my problem now, uh, actually, because I don't see the numbers. That, I need numbers in front of me. I can read them, but I need them. Yeah. So what I want to see is this 4.1 plus 3.2 plus 324,000 added into the reserves. What does that do if we're still collecting, which will be way too much, way too much. But then what if we don't collect on the reserve side at all from our from our tax levy? It's going to come down, but what's it going to come down by? I think is what I'm asking. Okay, is, fair enough. That clear. Fair enough. Uh, fair enough. Thank you for that clarification, and I, I think Mark and uh, Derek will uh, try to manage some numbers here. But certainly, the mayor, go ahead, and then Councillor Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to, in my mind, I need to keep things very simple as we move this forward. Um, we came into last week with a six and a half percent round numbers budget increase. We were going to be putting away $4 million into reserves because of our 10 year capital forecast. There was a lot of question. Uh, the MRA, I think, said we're not putting enough money into reserves. Uh, conflicting that, the MLA said we're putting too much money into reserves. Uh, we all also heard this morning that, you know, anticipated we are going to need some more money for accessibility and everything else. Leaving reserves aside, what I appreciate is first of all, and a special thank you to Director Donaldson. Um, first and foremost, since you have taken the helm as Director of Finance, you have refined our financials, you've given us more information, and you've given us significantly more accurate information. And I can tell all those people in Muskoka Lakes, we are in good hands. You also, dug deeper and you happened to find us $4.1 million that was there that wasn't there before. So at the end of the day, when we went into this budget at six and a half percent, because of council guidelines and what we knew before, we needed to put away $4 million was the target or whatever for uh, reserves. We all and many people question that because of MLA's comments and rightly so. Should we be putting away that much money? Is it $3.5 million we should be putting away? We could save a bunch of money. The reality is we have 4.1. Legislation says it goes into a reserve or it goes into the next year's revenue. It's been found now. If we were to take all $4 million and put it into next year's revenue forecast, we have a significant negative tax rate, like significantly negative. And then the 2023 budget, we're going to be back up and it's going to be a 30% jump in taxes based on an additional $4 million. There's no question that our financials need to be updated that shows the additional $4 million, changing the number from 15 million to 19 million. That's all great. I don't believe that makes a difference to what we do today unless we choose to give money back to the taxpayers of today. And I can tell you right now that would, my opinion would be significantly imprudent of us to do so 
because we're going to have a variable tax rate over the next three years of up and down, and it's going to be a yo-yo. Some years we take, some years we give back. What I also heard this morning is we've got an extra $350,000 from the province that ultimately will be going into reserves. So our forecast, I'm going $3.5 million to $4 million. We can short that because we have the extra money. We can bring a tax rate from roughly 6.5% to 3.5%. I'm fully in support of a three and a half percent increase. We heard last night federally from Krista Freeland that the economy is chugging along. We're not in a big recession. We're coming out of this. We're coming out of this faster than we came out of 2008. Yes, COVID is still here. But in my opinion, anything less than a three and a half percent increase would be financially inappropriate. We're going to have other things. Staff have done an amazing job at a operating budget at a one and a half percent below CPI. That's a great job. Thank you very much, staff. So I, I'm, I don't need to debate back and forth. We are sitting in a committee level here. When this comes to council, and my only question is going to be is Mr. Donaldson, before this comes back to council in the new year and the forecast, could all the schedules reflecting a $19 million round numbers capital forecast be included. And if they can be included before we actually pass this budget, I'm more than happy to move this on to council at a three and a half percent increase, knowing the information and the money we have, and yes, significantly building our reserves. And then we can make some more accurate decisions with an asset management plan, with a master fire plan, with all of the above going forward. Uh, but to me, anything less than a three and a half percent increase this year is financially irresponsible. So I'm happy to move this forward without any other discussion. I'll leave it at that. But to Mr. Donaldson, can all these numbers that we're talking about our financial reserves be updated before we finally pass this budget? Mark? I get sure. Yes, they can all be provided and council would have an opportunity to review them all in advance of the meeting. Yeah, thank you. I think that addresses some of the previous, uh, previous concerns. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Mayor. Uh, actually, a great summary of uh, where we are. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor uh, Jagwitz, uh, Member Jagwitz, go ahead, sir. You've got the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Director Donaldson for his very detailed, the very detailed uh, report that he gave today. I understand it was verbal, but I understand he's going to make it available to everyone. And I would hope that uh, at some point in the meeting today, he would indicate where we can find it because I looked for it and I couldn't find it. But before I, I ask the two questions I have, I'd like to just uh, say something that I, I, owe, I owe my fellow uh, councillors, committee members, an apology. Um, I've made some comments in the past about this unallocated surplus. Uh, and I made those comments before I had done enough due diligence to have, to have made those. So I apologize for that. I, I spent a good part of last week doing my due diligence, and I believe I fully understand what is happening here now. And um, I, I just want to correct the record of what I said. Uh, that surplus is real, although there's some question as, as to the amount. But, um, uh, Mr. Donaldson, would it be possible to put up note six that you you displayed? It would be page 17 of the audited financial statements, the one that shows the uh, uh, the general surplus amount. Is that possible or is that difficult? Would you like to see the actual financial statement or the no, slide well, the that one, I presented? The one you presented, because you 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 analyzed it. Uh, correct, correctly, by the way, in, in my view. I just wanted to uh, see if we're all on the same page here. So it's the, it's the next, yes, this page here. You'll see up at the top right that it shows a general surplus of 5.8 million. That's what I believe the unallocated surplus is. If you go down to the lower right, you'll see that what Director Donaldson has done is he said the 5.8 is made up of 4 million in cash. The balance is embedded in the net between accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventory and prepaid supplies. 
In other words, because these funds were mingled with the operating funds, part of it became used as working capital. So in order to make those reserves whole, the full 5.8 would have to be transferred to the reserves and the township would have to borrow the 1.7 million to make up the difference. Now, I'm not, I don't want to debate that necessarily today because whether it's 4 million or 5.8 is really not the principle. But what that does is if, we, if you accept the 5.8, then we have a surplus from 2021 which I estimate to be around 800,000. I don't know what the real number is going to be. And then we have this 325,000 that's found. So when you add those three up, the actual change to our reserves will be just about $7 million. So, so it is significant. And, um, and I, I approve of the way um, Director Donaldson is proposing to handle it. Um, so um, uh, one other thing I'd like to uh, uh, just state is that um, um, I'm of the opinion, I, I share the concern that Councillor Bridgman uh, has. I find it very difficult to vote on documents when the numbers are to be revised, especially when they're such significant revisions. However, I, I also agree with the mayor that there's no reason we can't move this forward to council as long as we would get those revised documents, let's say a week before or sometime, and they should be made available to the public also, so that if we still have concerns, we can raise them. But what that does is it means that I would vote in favor of moving this forward to council, but I, I would not vote in favor of endorsing it if it's going to be moved forward. The other uh, point is, and I asked uh, Director Donaldson earlier, I thought that we were increasing our reserves this year by 3.5% or 440,000. He now tells me that amount is 3.1% and I accept that. And he's also suggesting that we not do that increase and that 325,000 of it come from these uh, uh, with whatever they're labeled funds from the province and the other 65 approximate amount uh, be, be a reduction. So if that adjustment was made and the increase was brought to 3.5%, I would, I would support that concept, but I'd be, I'm unwilling to vote on it until I actually see the revised numbers. Thank you. So I would ask Dr. Donaldson, if you could tell us where we can find this detailed report you gave us today or where we will be able to find it. Okay, thank you. Let's deal with that first uh, before Councillor Bridgman. Uh, so Mark, you're going to uh, uh, put this report up on the uh, township website under uh, supplemental agenda or? The so clerk. Chair, I'll, I, will, I will work with the clerk to, uh, to ensure that this gets posted and we'll uh, communicate uh, where that can be located. I'm not exactly sure of the exact location this moment. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. The clerk's shaking your head. The council yes. should be advised where that is and so should members of the public. Uh, Absolutely. Please. Absolutely. Please. Okay, so that's a that's a big yes, of course. Yeah, so it'll go. Okay, so yeah, and we'll direct you to that and certainly to the public as well. Hopefully before the end of this meeting, we'll be able to tell you exactly where and how that's going to occur. Okay, good thoughts and thank you for your comments. Uh, Councillor Bridgman and Councillor Edwards. Barb? Thank you, Chair Zavitz. Um, I think, I, I assume you're going to put that update on Engage Muskoka Lakes so people get the, get the alert to uh, Director Donaldson, it's really handy. Um, I just wanted to echo uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. I don't wanna hold this up. I'm very comfortable with this moving forward at this point, but not voting on, on the contents of it. I do need more time. Uh, so I'm happy to move this forward as long as we have enough time to look at all the numbers going forward. So I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I do have a resolution. I'm going to ask the other two gen gentlemen before I go to the uh, 
Uh, there's uh, two people waiting, uh, Mr. Pato and Mr. Uh, Dale Hogg, as relates to the MLA. Um, just so you're privy to, you know, what, what this ask is or where we are in this platform today, uh, Councillor Jaglowitz, did you say that he couldn't endorse? That is a piece of the language, but I, I would say to you uh, that um, there are three pieces to a resolution today. The first is, uh, you know, acknowledgement of a reduction in the operating contribution uh, to reserves of X amount of dollars presenting, uh, resulting in a net levy of, of X, if you will. Uh, number two would be an increase in the opening balances of the reserve forecast, um, as the numbers are indicated. And number three, to uh, be forwarded to Township Council for approval. Now, um, Clearly, it's been stated since th this was, uh, you know, uh, created that uh, there would be a uh, fulsome report, according to the mayor and, and Mark's acknowledgement, that all of the documentation to support this notion would be in our hands uh, much before um, the meeting uh, scheduled for January the 12th. So, and of course, at that meeting, we have lots of opportunity to discuss and and and, uh, and do what we must do. Uh, I would ask then for you as a group, uh, just to sort of keep that in your mind and, uh, you know, not sure where this is going to end up at this point in time, but uh, we'll go to uh, Councillor Edwards, then Councillor Kelly, then Councillor Roberts, and then our two folks from uh, outside. Thank you, our two public folks. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I uh, agree with Councillor Jagger, which we could move this this forward so we're not holding it up. And uh, it would be nice if you just send the uh, report directly to us. And that I've had some uh, internet uh, and that problems, and uh, it would be nice to, to just get it emailed. Thank you. That's all we can do. Okay, good. We're doing it. We're doing that with dispatch. So thank you for that comment. Okay, Councillor Kelly, uh, then Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you. And through you, I, I want to echo uh, uh, something that the mayor said uh, uh, wholeheartedly, and that is that uh, uh, it, it, it frankly is a lot of diligence and a lot of, uh, I would say, moral turpitude on the part of Director Donaldson to dig in and find this and, and, and get it on the table. So full marks there. Um, but, you know, and it, we, we sometimes talk about, oh, we found money. Well, you know, it's, we didn't just trip over it. I think it took some diligence and some hard work. And I don't think we should back off on the diligence and hard work. If, if bringing the budget to the General and Finance Committee for its review and input is important, we should hold off and defer on any discussion or decision uh, until such time as we have the information in front of us that we need to add value. If it's not important, and if we can just kick it upstairs to the council and let them deal with it, why do we bring it here in the first place? Um, so, you know, I just don't understand what value we're expected to add if it's that easy. I don't understand particularly why we're holding anything up. This is new material, manifest information that's, that's not yet been part of our discussion or our, uh, our review. I think we, as a committee, uh, deserve the opportunity to have it lay in front of us, give it some thought, and then get back together and, uh, uh, make a decision to approve or not approve before it goes to council. Okay, thank That's you. That's it. Thank you. Okay, okay. And so uh, you know, we'll we'll be looking at that very piece uh, shortly. I, I, I get that sense. Um, Councillor uh, Roberts, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And through you, I'm going to hold off on my question until we hear that from the delegates because I had other questions pertaining spe to specific items in our um, in our current. Uh, uh, budget documents. Thank you. So I'll just hold on. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair Zavitz. Maybe uh, just one question. Um, you referred to uh, an X reduction, uh, uh, X amount of money, so on and so forth in a potential resolution. Um, maybe we could fill in those blanks and understand where we would be at, where we've gone from a 6-5 to a, is it a 3531, um, those numbers. I don't know what those blanks would fill in at as a committee recommendation. Um, I, I would suggest from a public perspective, um, we have advised the public that we would, the council would be considering a budget in the new year. I think it's on the 10th or the 11th or the 12th, or I'm not sure the exact date, early January. Um, and with all this information coming out ahead of that, uh, I, I'd still like to work towards that date, but obviously update all the financials going in there. Uh, to me again, 
I'm not educated enough and, and I won't have any more education on our asset management plan or our actual requirements over the next 10 years specifically to have any material change in my vote from a $15 million in reserve, $16 million, 17. The only thing it's going to affect is how much tax increase we're going to have this year. The numbers will be there, but I would be foolish again to say that, oh, it should be $16.2 million or $16.4 million. The question that's being asked today for me is how much of a tax increase do we wanna contemplate and then let the accountants do their thing. So um, again, what I've heard is that I think we're gonna be in and around a three and a half percent tax increase and all the substantiation, all the data and where we're going is there. And then we can make a new pro projection based on our asset management plan, master fire plan, everything else in 2022 and 23 and beyond. So um, again, I'm happy to move this to council, whatever that date is in January. And prior to that, all the updated financials and everything would come into play. Thank you. I believe that date is the 12th. Is Yeah. Okay. Right. So there are some. Yeah. There, there are some nuances to to that. So I think we'll we'll hold on that comment for a moment um, as we review that. Uh, I guess a couple of things. Will we be filling in uh, the CAO if I could? Will will we? Okay. okay. Yeah, so let's, uh, I'm gonna hear uh, if you, if I will, uh, Councilor Jagowitz, and we're quickly gonna go to the public and then we'll take a few minute break and get this sorted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. The, the clerk has just sent me uh, Mr. Donaldson's uh, report and, and there is no report. It's six slides that he showed us. I, I believe it's important that his report be committed uh, in right, to writing and be submitted and be part of this meeting. But that's not possible, I guess. So I, I, I believe that uh, that report should be prepared and then come to the next meeting before we consider the budget because these schedules of themselves don't tell the story. He told it very eloquently and I would like that to come to us in writing and form part of, the, uh, of this meeting so that it's there for the public record. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm withdrawing my statement of moving it forward, I think. Uh, we have to have that written report uh, prior to us considering this budget. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Mayor, comment? Um, thank you. I, again, I know we want to go to the public. Um, what I would like to, again, put on the table so we understand. The public is aware of a 6.5% increase. What we have talked about today is utilizing the uh, OSIF funding to lower that, and that would result in a new tax rate. Um, and I, I'd like to put that on the table, if we would, today, right now, prior to that discussion. Uh, I appreciate Councillor Jagwitz. I want to see it in a written report. The fact that there's a document and a slideshow also includes that written report. The public is aware of it. Um, and in a, yet a summary report uh, of where we're at that would come to Council, again, we'll carry everything over. Um, I, I don't want to get bogged down in a uh, comma, T, I, this didn't have the proper summary. All the numbers are there. We're aware of the numbers and we're gonna wrap it all up before council would vote on this. So, but I just like to have an idea of what potentially we're at at the 3.5 or whatever the number is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have um, two fine gentlemen that have been very patient. Uh, certainly Mr. Pato, Frank Pato, the Muskoka Lakes Association. Um, if Frank is here now, We'll, uh, there's Frank's iPhone. Hey, Frank, welcome, sir. I apologize for the late hour, if you will. Um, you have uh, two minutes, sir. You're muted, Frank. Thank, thank you, Chair Zavitz, and thank you, members of council. I'm sorry, I'm on a time delay watching the public thing, so I'm sorry if I'm off. I want to yeah. echo comments about um, Director Donaldson's incredibly good work. And I also want to thank um, CEO Hammond. I think the financial reporting continues to get better and better. And, and I also just, you know, as a member of the public, I want to put to ease um, what others might be concerned about uh, reflecting some of the mayor's comments. It's not like this 4.1 million was missing somewhere and we found cash lying around. It was hiding on your audited financial statements. So I think it's important that the public knows that the uh, 
the, the township is, is is being responsible with the taxpayers' money. I, I also will point out that this four point one million dollars is the taxpayers' money. It's money we've already paid in taxes, and it may be the right decision to take all that into the reserves. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but I am saying that four point one million is thirty three percent of the entire tax level we pay. It's a third of all the taxes we pay every year. So I think it is worthy of consideration as to you know, how this money is being allocated, the idea of setting up these brand new reserves for climate change and the CIP programs, I think also, those are all worthy of discussion. And so I will respectfully disagree with the mayor who was ready to sort of just push this through without further discussion. I think that's wrong. I think it is worthy of discussion and careful analysis. I also think it's wrong to make a statement that it's fiscally irresponsible uh, to lower people's taxes. I don't think you have a fiduciary duty to increase taxes every year. And I will point out that since 2011, uh, spending in the township of Muskoka Lakes has gone up 78% according to this new budget. Now, I, I agree with them. I, I like the direction you're going in. I, I would support a 3.5% increase in spending based on, you know, that's a 1.8% increase in the levy because the property values are going up roughly 1.8%. So I'm not against that and I'm supportive of that. But I, I just, I, I, I push back against um, that it's okay that our taxes have gone up almost 80% in the last 10 years and that the mill rate the tax we pay per dollar of assessed value has gone up almost 40% over that time period. That's not okay. That's not fiscally responsible. Uh, so I do think this is worthy of further analysis and discussion in the future to understand the reserve policies you're following and whether it is appropriate. I don't expect you to lower our tax rates, but I don't expect to keep getting five, six, 7% increases every year. And with that, I'll respectfully reiterate my strong endorsement of your staff and their good work, and also my deep appreciation for the members of this uh, council who are all digging in on these matters. I think it's appropriate to do so. So thank you very much, and thank you for letting me speak. Well, thank you, Frank. Great words. Uh, I'm going to call on Dale Hogg now, Dale, MLA, um, to provide his comment. There's Dale's iPhone. Dale, welcome. Same apologies extended, sorry for the late hour. Uh, go ahead, you've got the floor. Two minutes, please. You're muted, sorry, Dale. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? There you go, there you go. you're on, you're live, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I apologize, I couldn't listen to it on YouTube, so I wasn't able to hear Frank's comments, so I apologize if I repeat what he said. Uh, my name is Dale Hogg. I'm the uh, budget chair for the Muskoka Lakes Association, and my address is 1095 Rusty Rock Road in Gravenhurst. Um, <clears throat> we've submitted several, uh, just first, I'd just like to thank you very much for the opportunity to present again. Uh, it is much appreciated. I just wanted to address two uh, issues, the, uh, one with the operating budget and one with the capital budget or the, the capital budget, which are very different beasts. The operating budget, I guess our request is that right now, the budget is, this year's budget is based on taking a percentage and multiplying it to last year's budget. And last year's budget was based on taking the percentage and applying it to the year before and so on. And there's no connection to what the actual expenses are of the, 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 um, the township. And when you go to put your capital budget, the long-term capital asset budget, which people are working on right now, understanding the full cost of a facility is important to make a decision whether or not to say uh, consolidate multiple facilities or maybe outsource one particular service. So I think tying it to actuals is critical to putting together the future capital asset plan. So that's the, uh, the operating budget, that's our main request there. On the capital budget, I think there's been a misunderstanding in terms of our position on it. Uh, I've reviewed the capital budget. I've talked to Mark about it. We're in full support of the capital budget. There, I think he did an excellent job. If you read our latest email or letter, you'll see we detailed exactly why we think he did a great job on that, and we totally support it. However, if you look at the budget as he's presented it, it very clearly shows that the reserve requirement is less than $2 million. And this is in keeping with, you know, up until five years ago, 50 years at the township of Muskoka Lakes had reserves of around less than two million, three million dollars, and we totally support his plan or his budget plan for the next ten years, requiring two million dollars, and that's in keeping with, say, the township of Gravenhurst that has a two and a half million dollar reserve. And so, if you agree with the budget that the capital budget that's been presented, 
my analysis really strongly suggests that it's what should be two million dollars in reserves held, not twenty-two million that we currently have. And if anyone can explain to me the 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 problem with that logic, I'm happy to revisit what, our letter and submit a new one with a different view. If you know we've misunderstood what's been presented, but having had a chance to talk to a number of people about this, my only conclusion is that the proper reserve level is more like two million based on the capital budget presented. And I'm happy to talk to anyone and revise our letter if, in fact, we've made a mistake in this analysis. Just no one has come to me yet to explain the fallacy in that. So um, just once again, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity to do this and um, look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, Dale, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Thank you both for the comments. Thank you for being so patient with us uh, as we work through this process. I am now going to, um, see no other hands, I'm going to... Uh, we're going to call a 10 minute break. So maybe get back. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Councilor Roberts, you have your hand up. Then we're going to break till 12 noon to uh, get some paperwork back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't want to talk about the uh, community improvement plan. It was in the budget and the stuff that we'd wanted to talk about in the budget before we move forward. I, and I, first of all, I'm going to ask the question of seek clarification that I'm correct and then a suggestion. Um, and through to uh, Director Donaldson. Director Donaldson, I believe that if I read it correctly, it's $150,000 for 10 years going into the reserve for the community improvement plan. And that um, there are no details on that spend other than what was in the consulting report. Am I correct? Mark? That is correct. The amounts are being accumulated in the reserve. There is nothing in the current capital forecast that earmarks any of these monies for, for expenditure. Uh, thank you, Director. So then to committee then, um, there's $150,000 earmarked for 2022 with no details. So I'm in favor of supporting the $150,000, but not the expenditure items in the $150,000. Uh, $50, I would like to see, as we do with all the capital reserves, the 10-year plan even though it'll be high level, but specific, specific in 2022, where the money's going to go to. So that's what I ask, would, would like to ask that. Uh, so it's no change to the budget, still 150,000, but I, I'm asking for future, um, future meeting that before the, any of that money spent, the 10 year plan for that $150,000 is ballpark and the specifics given for 2022. Thank you. Mark, is that something we you can do is that viable you have the other runway there i don't have any specifics in terms of the details of what that money would be used for i would defer to uh cao hammond or director pink perhaps they might have a little bit more detail in terms of the plans on the community improvement and how that how those accumulated funds might be used in the future good thank you uh mayor has a comment uh, thank you. I, I think the reality is we may not spend any money in 2022, and hence the reason there's no capital uh, side on 2022. And as 2022 rolls out and the CIP plan gets approved, then in 23, 4, 5, we might attract some certain projects to it. It's just the starting point saying we know we're going to want to put away some money in this. So we're starting to put away our own reserve towards funding something in the future and it's going to cost a lot more than $150,000 that much I can promise. Okay, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Supplementary, Councillor Roberts. Thank you. My point is not when. So I want to have details be given to Council by year when that money comes up. If we're only going to give 2022 or 2023, I need to see those monies, that, 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 uh, those details before I approve it. So um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, CAO would like to make a comment. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make it clear that there's two aspects to the spend on the CIP program. Part of it will be uh, an incentivization program for the private sector. The other part deals with the capital. So uh, the money is intended to go sort of two ways, if you will. So um, staff will endeavor to um, uh, assuming council approves the CIP um, to update the uh, capital forecast. Thank you.
Good. Thank you for that comment. Uh, I would just acknowledge as well that we we are in receipt based on the supplemental agenda. We are in receipt of a Muskoka Lakes Association letter dated December the 10th on this topic, which will be on the site. I'm going to now call this uh, a, a quick break. We need to do a little bit of accounting over here and uh, we'll see you back here and uh, hopefully 12, 12.05 and get this thing wrapped up. Thank you.
Okay, committee, welcome back. We're just awaiting a few of our peers here. There's uh, Councilor Nishikawa, so just Councilor Mazan. Um, I think just pre, as we prepare, welcome back to the public, of course. Uh, a lot of listening has been going on since that public meeting, and I, I certainly want to reinforce that notion that um, there's a lot of collaboration going on here. I appreciated the words of the MLA folks that came on here and, and their letter. Uh, people are concerned. People want uh, to feel good about this, and I think we're showing that we're doing everything in our power to get a, a, a very good a result uh, out of this here and now. And, and to move this, this item along, that being our 2022 budget. Um, I see that we have everyone here now. I think as a, a preface to, uh, I do have a resolution here that I will be reading and that we will be putting up on the screen for you all to see. Uh, full disclosure, of course, uh, every assurance that uh, the information that uh, you're considering is uh, here in front of you now. And you'll see that when, um, when I read it in its entirety, but pre that, I'm going to call on Mark Donaldson to, I, I suppose, um, I suppose bring it all back, bring it all back to where we are right here, right now, and um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Chair, and uh, appreciate the comments and input from everyone, uh, committee, and the public. Um, I think what I, if I, what I've heard um, in the last. Uh, discussion last hour or so, um, is that committee is generally supportive of the use of the OSIF funds to reduce contributions to reserves in the operating budget. And as stated in that report, that would reduce the net levy increase from 6.6% to 3.5%. So I, I, think I, I think I've understood that. Um, I would uh, just note for committee that the 3.5% then would be fully reflective of the increase in operating costs over the 2021 budget. So if the levy were to go below 3.5% over last year, um, then a portion of that increase in 2021, or sorry, in 2022, would effectively be funded from reserves. We would be funding our operating increase from reserves if it's less than 3.5%, because that is the increase that includes the, the new positions that were added and so on. Um, and then I think the, the other item that I, that I think I've heard clearly and, and as I have uh, stated, uh, we will make the adjustment to the opening balance on the 10-year reserve forecast. Um, we will make that increase and the contributions and the level of forecast, sorry, yes, the level of forecasted reserve balance over the 10 years um, will be informed in the future once we have uh, completed the work as, as I had indicated around what is municipal best practice around reserve management and how do we set the reserve levels uh, for the township uh, according to its needs. And I think that once additional information becomes available through the asset management plan and the various master plans we have um, coming forward, that will become more clear in terms of how that uh, reserves uh, balance should be managed. So I think those were the three, three things I heard, uh, Chair. Uh, and I just wanted to reiterate that for, for committee. Good, thank you very much for that, of course. Uh, I see Councillor Kelly, committee member Kelly has his hand up, sir, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question, uh, a quick clarification from Director Donaldson. When you mentioned the three and a half percent increase funding the uh, operating expense increase, is that's, you're talking about um, the <clears throat> budget 21 number versus budget 22, you're not measuring that against forecast 21, right? That that's correct. That would be that is a that is the percentages that we've been discussing. Um, they have been the 2022 budget was developed using historical information to try to arrive at the numbers, but the percentages that we've been referring to throughout the discussion has been budget to budget. But. Okay, but there's the budget to forecast 21 is a 10.6% increase in, in operating expense by my math. Is, so I'm taking total expense minus the total increase in revenue minus increase minus the contributions from reserve in operating revenue as well. So it's the net expense increase 
of expense and the revenue. So everything on the operating summary, excluding contributions to reserves. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Councillor Jagowitz and I'm gonna read something. Uh, so, so thank you, uh, through you, Chair, to, to Director Donaldson. Uh, yes, I, in, I agree with the three points you mentioned, but in addition to that, I also requested that the verbal reports you gave us be, be put in writing and form part of this record or come to us at the next meeting, and you, you, you passed by that. Is that okay. your intention, sir? Thank you, and I can answer the question, of course, because it is embedded in our resolution that I'm about to read. Oh. Uh, that there will be an explanatory staff report. So thank you for you know bringing that forward. Again, a lot of listening has gone on uh, these past days. So thank you for that. Is there any we have a supplementary, uh, Councillor Jagowitz? You're good. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So uh, oh, so I'm so sorry, Councillor Ishikawa. You have your hand up. Go ahead. I, I'm just going to say now, um, I, I don't think I'll have an opportunity to uh, voice this after you've read it. I am not comfortable on voting on anything today. I feel like lots of numbers and lots of discussion has happened, but it's, there's nothing in front of me. So I'm not even sure if this should be read. That's my concern. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Councillor uh, Roberts, go ahead. Yes. Yes, um, I just I don't I want to listen to your resolution, or our resolution. Sorry, but then may, may may want to comment after that resolution before we vote on it. Is that okay? Uh, that's fine. I, I, here's my point. We're going to put it up now. Please do. Uh, we're going to put the resolution up in front of you. I have not got a full screen, so I can't see anyone's everyone's hand up. So I'm going to need somebody to help me with that. Um, What's that? Yeah, well, no question about that. Okay, so in front of you is uh, the resolution. Uh, and again, uh, here it is. I mean, you're all looking at it now, be it resolved. Uh, can I, should I read this before calling a vote? Just for general interest, be it resolved, the General Finance Committee recommend in principle. Uh, I think that was a, a very important uh, word, word usage there. In principle, to counsel that the 2022 draft operating capital budget and forecast attached to uh, that report uh, be endorsed as amended, including a reduction in the operating contribution of reserves, uh, as was according to Mark's earlier statement, uh, two, an increase in the opening balances uh, to those numbers that you see there, again, agreed upon, and number three, be forwarded to Township Council for approval together with an explanatory staff report. That uh, approval would happen on, December, on January the 12th, uh, anyway, that, that would be that next meeting. So um, it's in front of you, committee. Uh, uh, lots of hands up now. So uh, Councillor Kelly, Jagowitz, and uh, Roberts. And Nishikawa. Uh, through you, and thank you. Uh, I just uh, trying to make sure I understand what we're being asked here. Uh, when it says that it recommends that something be endorsed, is that the same as endorsing it? Uh, clerk, do you, you wanna weigh in on that? Interpretation is important here, I guess, certainly. Yeah, through you, we can, we can add clarifying language that it be endorsed in principle as amended, including blank. Um, that's why I was asking the question because I think that's essentially what this means is that we're being asked to endorse the thing in principle that we haven't, haven't yet really seen. And that's it. Okay. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So am I hearing you want to see some, sorry, sorry, move some words around or Again, we, we did go back and forth on it. So I, I think we all know, I mean, you know what, I'll hold comment. Yeah, Councillor uh, Jagger, let's go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I agree with um, the previous councillor. Um, I won't be voting in favor if we're endorsing it. I will vote to have it move forward for consideration by council, but, but not endorsed. 
The second item is I disagree with the 4.1 million. It's 5.8. Um, so I will not be supporting if that number stays the same. And I'd like number three to be clear to state that uh, the director's presentation, verbal presentation will be submit will be submitted in writing. That it's not just what does it say? I can't see on my screen, but something with an explanatory. So those are the three changes I'd like to see. Thank you. Okay, did we uh, document? Does anyone uh, here inside this room? We lost the downstairs internet. Okay, we've got a problem technically now. We've lost. We've lost Mark and uh, Phil. So, great. Um, how do we acknowledge uh, Councilor Jaglowitz's uh, concerns? Obviously, the, uh, I guess there's a wording, the wording piece to it. Well, you know what, while we wait, while we try to work th this out, uh, we'll move on with uh, Councilor Roberts and Councilor Nishikawa. And we'll circle back on that, of course. Thank you. Um, given um, our history on general finance and uh, council, I'm not in favor of this going directly to council. I think this is just too much information at the, at the last minute, given to us a week before to, 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 uh, to understand and ask our questions. I think um, this should come to a special general finance meeting. And the question I have is why can't that happen? And what's the what is the big problem with delaying this to approval in February? What like what what's what what will stop? What 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 business will be stopped if we delayed this? Because other years we haven't approved our budget till February. I ask that question. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Nishikawa. We're, I'm not ignoring the question, but we're just going to take you guys in aggregate at this point while we're trying to figure this out. Well, I, I think my my uh, concern, Chair Zavitz, is that generally the heavy lifting is all done at committee. We should be this should be sailing through when it gets to council. Council isn't where we then start deliberating this topic again, and that really concerns me because I don't I I feel blank, and I I I I heard a comment that. Well, we all get it. Well, we we all don't get it, and I'm one, and I would say that I. Um, have been paying very close attention for days and days and days, and um, I don't get it. And I'm really concerned that we try to move this forward to council, much like the other speakers have talked about. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you for that comment. Uh, the mayor's got his hand up. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. And I apologize. I got uh, kicked out of the meeting. I'm not sure that was intentional or not, but um, I appreciate everybody. Uh, wanting more information and i agree we need some more information um, i guess the question i would ask at this point we we have a published uh for the past few months we've talked about potential adoption to Councillor robert's perspective uh, adoption of this in january so that was always our target um we have scheduled that as uh, the, the public is aware of that i guess the question is how soon could we get these updated financials um, and this updated information to council to be able to digest. Is it possible to get this before the Christmas break? Um, at which point, maybe it answers all our questions. Maybe it asks more questions. Um, and then if this comes to council as scheduled in January, if we're not comfortable, I think we then stand the opportunity. We can always defer the decision at that point. Nobody says we have to say yes or no come January. So um, I, I don't mind giving ourselves some deadlines, but I wouldn't want to just get this report five days before the January meeting. I agree with that. So if potentially we could get this information and the updated everything in the next seven days before the Christmas break, uh, I'd be okay to uh, keep the schedule going forward. I'll leave it at that. Okay, committee, um, any other hands? There's Councillor Ridgman, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Zavitz. I think I better chime in on this too. I, I'm not comfortable in putting numbers into this resolution um, as an endorsement. So I don't have an issue going forward in January if we get all of our numbers before the 1st of January to uh, to do this at, at, at council, but I'm not supporting this as it sits now because it sounds to me like I'm agreeing to a 3.5% net levy increase 
And I am, I want to see all the numbers to see if perhaps that can be less with what's, what's happened with all the numbers today. So that's my comment. Okay. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, uh, Chair Travich. Uh, I'm not comfortable with this. Uh, I don't like the numbers. We're going from over 6% down to 3.5, just like that, without any anything. I want to say everything first and that, uh, and that. so uh, I wouldn't be supporting this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Zavitz. Again, I haven't heard every discussion. I, I'm wondering whether or not at this particular point, um, we refer this back to GNF in January and we set a new public meeting or potential adoption date going forward that gives everybody opportunity to debate this back at GNF one more time. Um, because I don't think uh, if we if this does particularly fail today, um, we're still back in zero. Uh, our staff needs some time over the holidays. Um, we've had an extremely busy fall. Uh, we continue to throw special meeting after special meeting after special meeting. So um, I guess uh, I would look to say maybe this gets referred back to our January GNF. I know it's not uh, the time frame for the public. Look to our clerk. Maybe we can take the resolution down so I can see other people uh, or we can all see each other people. But um, and what that means from a schedule. And then we plan out a spring charted course, potentially. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, my sentiments. Uh, would we then look to a deferral, uh, Clerk? Is that what we would be doing? Defer it, and we need to check how much public notice we give. Yeah. Okay. So I get, I think we're going to need another little break here because there's a the the the, uh, the, the subtle nuance is we have a public notification, and we have to be within the bounds of that. So. I think I'm going to call a uh, maybe five, eight, eight minute. We'll come back as soon as we can from here. But we need to, uh, in terms of how we would do the meeting piece next, uh, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you. I, I, as far as uh, committee and Madam Clerk, correct me if I'm wrong. We could refer this back and defer this to our January GNF meeting. Um, and later on today in council, you could advise us as to what the new schedule would look like. I don't think we need that information. Uh, uh, as we move forward here today, it's basically going to reset everything. Um, we'll need your input. So uh, I don't think we do need a break now. We should be able to wrap up this meeting uh, with a deferral on this particular one. And then you can advise us at even via email what the new schedule might look like. Mr. Hammond, maybe. That makes total sense. And, and uh, our clerk is shaking her head. Yes. Let me just uh, bring the CAO on here. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to make sure that staff are crystal clear as to committee's direction. So we talked about a number of things this morning. My understanding of what you said was you want the further information on the unallocated surplus moving to the um, to the discretionary reserve. You also were fine in terms of, in, in principle, a 3.5% tax rate based on the reduction of the OSIF funds to the contribution to reserve. So I heard, I heard 2021 reserve contributions. So what I'm, what I'm trying to see clarity on is those three items, because I want to make sure that Mr. Donaldson's report addresses to the next, his report to the next GNF committee addresses what I heard this morning. Uh, so essentially, the intent of his PowerPoint presentation was to document the unallocated surplus piece. Um, I heard comfort with that. And then I also heard comfort with the OSIF report. So um, are you, if, if the staff report addresses those issues, plus Councillor Roberts' uh, point about the capital forecast with respect to the uh, um, CIP, is that what you're expecting in that report? Are we missing anything? Thank you, CAO. I see hands up, uh, Councillor Jagowitz and Bridgman, and then we'll move on. Uh, yes, um, uh, CAO, uh, through you, Chair. Um, I believe you're missing my request that uh, Mr. Donaldson's verbal report be put in writing and be part of this record and submitted to us so we all can understand exactly what he said. He said a lot of things and talked about a lot of numbers. I don't disagree with them all. I disagree with a lot, or I agree with a lot of them. I think it should be documented in writing so we have a chance to look at it in the form of a staff report. 
which is what he actually gave us this morning. He gave us a verbal staff report. I believe it should be in writing and to us before the next meeting. Thank you. Good, thank you. And I'm gonna call the CAO yet again. Thank you for the distinction with respect to a staff report, because I would, you know, I would say that the documentation was there on the PowerPoint slides, which will be uh, added to or identified in the agenda. But to the extent that you wish to see that information in a staff report, thank you for that. We will include that. Uh, sup supplementary. Um, this is recorded. If he doesn't have his presentation uh, in, uh, in writing now, certainly a staff member can transcribe it. It's the way, what he explained, uh, those, those slides are not sufficient to give a complete understanding of what he said. That's my view. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bridgman. Thank you, Chair Zavitz. So um, CEO Hammond, I'm, uh, the other part of why I'm asking these questions is I, I'm not in principle supporting a 3.5% increase at this point because we've got this money going into the reserves now that we didn't have before. So what I need to do is look at all of that. And I'm looking at maybe a potential reduction in what we agreed to putting into the reserves this coming year, which will bring it down from 3.5% if, if I've am if i got this all correct. So that is that is what I would like to see, Mr. Donaldson, even if you can just tell me X amount of reserves that come out again to lower the levy by 1%. I, I can figure that out on my own, but I need, I am still not set on 3.5% with all this new information. So I hope that clarifies it for you. Um, Mayor has got his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a uh, little bit of a backtrack. This council, this council set a budget guideline of 5% that we felt was appropriate for the taxpayers going forward. I do appreciate that we have found a bunch of other money that was not recorded, um, that is changing our reserve balance and our reserve contributions. Um, Mr. Donaldson has made a recommendation originally at 6.5 is where we got to, and then it got lowered as such potentially today to a 3.5. If we wanna change that forward, I suggest we discuss that at our next GNF meeting. Uh, let the numbers come out, let the updated um, financial reserves come out at 19 million or whatever they're gonna net out to. And at which point we can all debate and deliberate going forward. Mr. Donaldson had made a recommendation today. Clearly that's not gonna be supported by council. So I'm gonna suggest we all go back and do our due diligence. I'm sure we will hear once again from the MLA and we'll also hear from the MRA once again, and uh, we can move forward. But um, trying to say, do we now wanna change our target from a three and a half to two and a half percent? If it's all about understanding the full financials, then let's put them on a piece of paper and understand them all. And then we can come back and reset this whole process is my recommendation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, then we'll move on. Uh, thank you, and through you, I, I actually think uh, uh, Mayor Harding and, and Councillor Bridgman are saying largely the same thing. Uh, I, I think that the budget book that was put together for us in, I don't know when it was, September, October, is a great place to start. And if we update that, uh, those spreadsheets with the new information, uh, and, and, and you know, if there's more than one choice to be made, then add another column or two, it, it, it becomes much easier for us to look at it, evaluate the possibilities. But uh, Mayor Harding, you're quite right. I mean, when we have a look at this and see what the choices are, we may opt for a lower number. Uh, I mean, I'm hopeful that we can, uh, but we won't know till we see where the numbers roll. And uh, best way, as far as I'm concerned to present that is to pick up where you left off on your seven, six and five spreadsheet just use that as the format. It's it's clean, it's simple, and it's easy to follow, and we're all comfortable with it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so Mark, um, our finance side of things, uh, are you comfortable with all of the uh, the dialogue here, the commentary? Uh, you have a good sense of some of the council, some of the committee members' ideas and notions about what additional information uh, they'd like to see in a report. I guess my thought might be comma. <laughs> When might one expect that pre um, pre uh, January first? So thank you, Chair. So, in with respect to the understanding, I believe the CAO um, 
described it, and I believe that that, my, that I have consistent understanding. So I think we'll we'll work from that list um, with respect to when this information will be available. Uh, I will endeavor to get this to committee members uh, before the holiday break, so that uh, there is ample time for all members to uh, review it carefully and submit any questions that you may have prior to the meeting, so that we can um, clarify. Uh, the content of what will be presented at the next general finance committee. Okay, good. With that, thank you, and for that, and and with that assurance, uh, I'm going to essentially announce to all that the this uh, item will be deferred until the uh, the January cycle of general and finance at that meeting at that time, and they will be reporting to you uh, updated information to you uh, pre pre the Christmas holiday. So given uh, that's what we've discussed, that's what we've agreed. I, I think we're just moving right along now. Is that uh, seeing no other hands? That's what we'll do. Um, thank you all for that. Uh, item 7A, I'm going to receive into the record the minutes of the uh, Public Library Board meeting held on October 19th and thank them for their Excellent efforts, Economic Development Committee. I'm accepting those minutes of the Grants and Economic Development Committee meeting held on a Wednesday, October 27th. Thank you for that. Item nine, unfinished business. Is there any uh, committee, any unfinished business to discuss at this uh, stage? Okay, not seeing any, hands up. I would go to new new business, uh, District Municipality of Muskoka updates. So in no particular order, I guess the mayor, uh, Mayor Thank Harding. You. We had a couple of meetings. Uh, one of them would have been a similar one that uh, Councillor Jagwitz would have had in uh, finance and that's regarding our water wastewater budget. Uh, Plan at 3.2 came in at 2%. Solid waste is above the guidelines. It's, ex it's expensive. Uh, and we know solid waste is. Uh, we're in a transition program. As I mentioned before, we've uh, awarded a contract that will start next fall, but there will be overlap and extra costs this year. And then two years from now, we'll be into our uh, uh, transition program for blue box and recycling uh, that should again lower our levy. Um, the only other item of note is our uh, committee has recommended to council uh, to reopen a snowmobile trail through Port Carling. Uh, there's about 145, 150 letters of support. So greatly appreciated. And that should be up and running for the coming season. That'll be my report. Thank you. Good. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Councillor Nishikawa, do you have uh, an update for us? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, essentially, um, you know, basically at, at Committee of, uh, or, or, excuse me, I'm, I'm thinking about two different things, but Essentially, there, there is nothing to report at this moment about health services other than, um, I'm sure Councillor Jav Jav Jagowitz will discuss the financial end of things. Um, but otherwise, we're just planning for the new Fairburn home. Uh, lots of more details coming. And then uh, again, um, the paramedic services, which have expanded. I'm going to just take this moment, if I could, to um, discuss the community services within our own township, Muskoka Lakes in that the health, uh, excuse me, the food bank, uh, West Muskoka Food Bank has um, last Wednesday, they uh, put together over a hundred um, food baskets for Christmas, along with um, today, they're all being distributed. There is, that, that's only a small amount of what the food bank is giving back to people this season. But I, I, I want to mention that there was um, a good amount of volunteers present and it was quite a slick process. And today I'm sure is going to be even more slick. You know, I, I've been there when they've done it and, and I think we should support our food bank, not just financially, but also all of those volunteers that donate their time over uh, the season. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great job. Uh, Councillor uh, Councillor Jaglitz. Frank, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I attended several meetings as some were joined. I won't, uh, I'll just single out one, one item. Uh, I did not report last month. I had to leave earlier. So I'm gonna talk about one item on the uh, uh, FCS committee, uh, financial and corporate services meeting of October 20th. 
Uh, they brought forward the OPP the annual billing statement and it did not include breakdown by municipality. Uh, staff was asked uh, why not and they were told that the OPP will no longer provide the report but they'll provide the data that staff can prepare the report. Staff was instructed to do so. At the November 17th meeting, um, staff came forward with an eight page uh, report, uh, solid with numbers. Uh, and they analyzed by area municipality the calls for service. They did not take it the next step and, and, and multiply it out. I did that yesterday and I'll just very quickly, there's two factors on OPP costs. 53% of the cost is based on the number of properties in each municipality. In that regard, we have 20% of the properties, so we pay 20% of that. Calls for service are based on a four-year rolling average. And the information that came out is that we account for 10.6 of the time and calls for service of the district. So when you multiply that times the 46% of the cost, you end up with a number. When you add it all up, uh, our bill should be as it was the year before, 2.8 million. Our 37% is 5.8 million. We're paying 3 million more. Thank you. I just thought that'd be interesting for tomorrow's meeting since this subject will come up. Thank you. That's my report. Thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards, sir. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Zavich. Um, we had a presentation by Jeff Ross from the uh, Spoka Watershed Council on uh, governance. Uh, there were some uh, questions uh, because they uh, incorporated, although they did do get some funding from, from the district plus staff time, uh, one of the councillors thought we should have more than, than one on the her, uh, her, uh, uh, executive board, even though we, we do sit on the watershed council. So uh, I was in, in, in support of that. I, I don't think it should be top heavy, because what they're finding is a lot of people say there's too much uh, and that governance coming from the, uh, the uh, district. And since it's a volunteer organization, uh, it's hard getting volunteers. So that, that is just, just one of the things that we're talking about. Uh, just a second here. And uh, the integrated watershed management uh, finance is giving us 500,000, which is uh, the federal in intake of uh, number six. And um, they are giving uh, uh, 400, 424,100 plus GST to uh, the district uh, structure and watershed management. Uh, and that was given to Hatch Limited to, to do that study. And uh, hmm. the Ontario uh, Community Housing Initiatives, whereas the District of uh, Muskoka has funding in the amount of $233,335 for capital repair. Uh, they are uh, putting that to um, the nonprofit, and they were doing uh, actually uh, repairs on, on, on housing for that. And uh, most of the uh, repairs are, are roof, asphalt, curbing, sidewalk repairs, furnaces, furnaces. So uh, that's what it is. Uh, the funding that they're getting is 233,000. The actual repair costs are 711,300. And that is my report. Good, thank you very much. Uh, item 10B, community events update. Now, sorry, uh, Councillor Kelly, go ahead. I would just like to uh, uh, thank Mayor Harding, um, Chief Morell, and Director Becking for all the work they did to help us get the Lions Club Santa Claus Parade off last Saturday. Um, Mayor Harding got roads closed. Uh, Director Becking was involved in that. Uh, Fire Chief uh, Morell was involved in security and they participated in the parade as did the mayor. Um, it was, it felt really, really good 
to be back to something that felt like normal. We had a rough day of weather, as you probably recall, heavy winds, heavy rain, great turnout from, uh, from the participants on floats. And I think initially we started out with huge crowds, but I think most of them got caught by the wind and blew to Milford Bay before we got to them. So uh, uh, crowds were down a little bit, but I'll tell you what, it was so gratifying to see kids and everybody, old people, families, everybody uh, enjoying themselves. So um, full credit and thanks for all the help that, uh, that everybody was able to give us to pull this thing together on such short uh, notice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else, uh, any community events updates uh, for your respective areas? Oh, Councillor Roberts. Go ahead, sir. Oh, Gord, you're... Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, in, in the Milford Bay community, um, last Saturday, we had a visit from Santa Claus. And Santa Claus sat underneath the um, gazebo that was built by the community um, last year. And uh, the fire the fire brigade was there, fire uh, volunteers with their fire truck and gifts were given out to all the children uh, fr through, the, um, through the library. And uh, there's a collection and uh, my numbers might be wrong here, but the collection for the for dollars for the uh, donation to the food bank over $500. So it was a great event um, that we had in Milford Bay um, on the weekend, and we thank all participants, and um, that's the, the report to, from Milford Bay. Excellent, thank you, thank you very much. Any, anything else, anyone else? Okay, good, good, we're gonna move on to item 11, uh, general information and correspondence from our 444 municipalities in Ontario. Is there any anything in there that you'd like to pull out or uh, A through, um, I guess it's A through O, uh, anything there that you've seen? Any comments you'd like to make? We can pull that, pull that out, put it on the next uh, GNF meeting. Okay, seeing none. Seeing none, I'm going to re read a resolution. Thank you for your time today. Um, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that this meeting adjourn at 12.50 p.m. And the next regular meeting of the General Finance Committee will be held on Wednesday, January the 15th, 2022 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair electronically from the Council Chambers Municipal Office in Port Carling, Ontario. All those in favor? That's carried. That's unanimous. Okay, Chair Zavitz. So, yeah, Chair Zavitz, if I may, I'm going to recommend that we start council at uh, 145, give everybody an opportunity to grab some lunch and especially our staff. Thank you. Yeah, we were just going to deal with that. So excellent. Okay, everyone, we'll see you all back here at uh, 145. Cheers.